Welcome once again to our regional virtual workshop on animal biotechnology in Asia and Oceania. We have uh, our partners here with USDA FAST, Virginia Tech, and ISA Biotech Information Centers, and of course CSIRO with uh, Mark Dizard. Yesterday, we had a three hour workshop which started with the presentations of Dr. Carl Ramage on modern biotech tools such as genetic engineering and uh, genome editing in improving animals, especially for disease and pest control, environmental protection and adoption, to climate change, animal and consumer, consumer welfare, food health, safety, and production, and for industrial purposes. A number of biotech animals developed through biotechnology were presented which were detailed further by Dr. Tim Doran on poultry, livestock by Dr. Lercio Portoneto, and in aquaculture by Dr. Eric Hallerman. With the enormous scientific research in biotech animal product development, bringing the technologies to the farmers and large scale commercialization, the benefit consumers need regulatory oversight, policy considerations that would facilitate adoption and commercialization of, geno of genetically engineered and genome edited animals were presented by Dr. Diane Ray Cahen, who discussed that effective regulatory approaches should be science-based, risk proportionate and defensible, credible to the public, timely and predictable, appropriate for intended use and transparent to all. Country regulatory policies were provided by Dr. Peter Tigerson of OGTR Australia and Dr. Claro Mingala from the Philippines. In summary, creation of new innovative and safe agricultural products needs to be encouraged to address the growing global challenges and threats. This can be enhanced by crafting regulatory policies that are product-based, science-based, and risk proportionate. And uh, so thank you once again to our panelists and the active participation of the audience during the first day. Again, we invite everyone to actively participate by posting questions at the Q&A box. This will be read and answered later. We have a post webinar survey posted at the chat box at the end of the workshop, which will be the basis of the certificates. So today we will continue session four to be moderated by Dr. Mark Tizard of CSIRO, after which we will have the video presentation of Dr. Lai on opportunities in swine biotechnology. The discussion afterwards will tackle the session four, the whole of session four, as well as the presentation of Dr. Lai. So it's, uh, let me call in Mark, Dr. Mark Tizard to start the floor and uh, uh, read uh, and introduce all our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Ola, yes. and. Uh, that was a terrific day yesterday, some great questions. We're continuing the theme of yesterday, um, and, and it's a, a great pleasure to introduce two speakers from uh, the Asia region, because it's about Asia and Oceania that uh, this workshop is focused. Um, I also would like to quickly say a big thank you to everybody involved, uh, that this is being done in, in the English language, and that's not the first language for many of our speakers or participants. Um, so we're, we're very grateful for that. Um, so without further ado, um, I will hand over to uh, our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is uh, Mr. Asao Nakamura. For, he's the Deputy Director of Plant Product Safety um, in the Food Safety and Consumer Affairs Bureau, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Forestry and Fisheries in Japan. Uh, Japan has uh, obviously addressed this uh, space of technology and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about the, the policy directions and and regulation uh, that are happening in Japan. So um, Dr. Nakamura, I can invite you to share your screen. Oh, in fact, actually, it's going to be shared by us. So yeah, over to you, uh, Mr. Nakamura. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you for giving me the chance to speak here today. Let me introduce myself. My name is Isao Nakamura, and I'm in charge of regulating genetically modified organisms and genome editing organisms for agricultural products in terms of preventing their impact on biodiversity. 
I'd like to explain Japanese policy of agricultural products obtained by genome editing technology from the viewpoint of biological diversity. I hope my presentation will help you understand the content and concept of the policy uh, concerning agriculture, forestry, and fishery products obtained through genome editing technology in Japan. In, today, in today's presentation, uh, I will explain three main points. First, the regulations and points to consider when evaluating environmental impacts of LMOs in Japan. Second, uh, handling of genome editing organisms in the interest of biosafety. And finally, the procedure for agricultural, forestry, and fishery products obtained by genome editing technology. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, first, uh, I will explain the regulation of LMOs for agricultural products in Japan. LMOs are regulated from three points of view. Uh, from the viewpoint of food safety, LMOs are regulated by food sanitation law and food safety basic law. Uh, food sanitation law is under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. And food safety basic law is under the jurisdiction of the Food Safety Commission. From the viewpoint of field safety, LMOs are regulated by field safety law and food safety basic act. Field safety law is under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. And food safety basic law is under the jurisdiction of Ministry of the Food Safety Commission. Uh, from the perspective of impacts on bio, biosafety and uh, biodiversity, LMOs are regulated by Cartagena Act, which is administrated by the Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. LMOs are allowed for distribution, importation, and cultivation, and so on after competition. Uh, completion of scientific safety assessment. Next slide, please. I explain from the perspective of biodiversity that I'm in charge of. I mentioned Car the Cartagena Act, but its formal nomenclature is act on the act on the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity through regulations on the use of living modified organisms. It is as known as Cartagena Act because formal name is too long. The purpose of this act is to ensure the precise and smooth implementation of the Cartagena Protocol of Biosafety to, uh, biosafety to the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, thereby contributing to the welfare of humankind and helping to assure healthy cultural lives for the people now and in the future. By taking measures to regulate the use of living modified organisms in order for the conservation and the sustainable use for biological diversity through international cooperation. The Cartagena Act, while Ministry of the Environment has overall jurisdiction, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fishery, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Education, Culture, Sport, Science and Technology, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, and Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry are responsible for the ministries concerned in each field. Ministry of the Environment and Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fishery are in charge of LMOs for agriculture, forestry, and fishery products. Next page, please. Uh, I'll explain five points to consider in the environmental risk assessment for LMOs, easy animals. The first is competitive advantages. 
We confirm competition against wild animals for resources such as food, nesting site, habitat, etc. The second is predatory or parasitic. We check interference with inhabitation or growth of wild plants or animals by preying on or being parasitic on them. The third is production of harmful substances. We confirm production of harmful substances interfering with inhabitation or growth of wildlife. The fourth is growth ability. We check hybridization with wild animals and transmitting inserted nucleic acid. The last one is other properties. We confirm such as indirectly effect on wildlife and by, uh, so by changing the ecosystem. We will confirm that there is no problem with all of these. Next slide, please. I'll talk about handling of genome editing organisms in the interest of biosafety. From May 2018 to January 2019, the Central Environmental Council of Japan discussed the handling of organisms obtained through genome editing technology. The Central Environmental Council have issued the following recommendation. First, if an extracellularly processed nucleic acid is not inserted into the host, the organisms are not regarded as LMOs in Cartagena Act. Next, if an extracellularly processed nucleic acid is inserted into the host and the finally obtained organisms contain the nucleate acid or replicated product thereof, the, the organisms are regarded as LMO in Cartagena Act. It is necessary to take appropriate measures in Cartagena Act. Finally, if an extracellularly processed nucleic acid is inserted into the host and the finally obtained organisms are confi confirmed as free of nucleic acid, the organisms are not regarded as LMO in Cartagena Act. In other words, the product base is used to determine whether it corresponds to LMO in Japan. Next slide, please. I'll explain summary of MOE notification. On February 8, 2019, Ministry of the Environment of Japan issued notification. Uh, handling of organisms which are obtained through genome editing technology, but which are not defined as LMOs stipulated in Cartagena Act. In the notification, MOE notifies the basic policy of handling such organisms and requests other competent authorities to deal with those. The first is prior to the use of such organisms, those who intend to use them should provide information regarding the characteristics of the, of the organisms and the result of review of the possible adverse effect on biological diversity to the competent government authorities. However, this should not apply to cases where the organisms are used in environment wherein containment measures stipulated by the ordinance under Article 12 of Cartagena Act or measures approved by the competent competent government agency are being taken. After the beginning of the organisms, if it is determined that they have the potential risk of adverse effect on biological diversity, the user should immediately take necessary measures to prevent the effect and should report it promptly to the competent government agency. Next slide, please. And as for Cartagena Act, Ministry of the Environment has overall control over all genome editing organisms. 
Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, and Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry uh, in charge of their respective fields. Ministry of the Environment and Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries are uh, in charge of agricultural products obtained by genome editing technology. Next slide, please. I'll explain procedure for the, for the use of agriculture products of genome editing technology. In October, October 2019, responding to the emote notification, uh, MAF issued a notification regarding specific procedures for providing information to the MAF regarding organisms obtained through genome editing technology, which falls under administrative jurisdiction of the MAF. Of the MAF. Next slide, please. I'll talk about contents of the MAF notification. First, MAF requests users to prepare a draft of information form and consult with MAF. We call it prior consultation. We assume user as developer and importer. MAF will study the contents in an examination opinion of persons with relevant knowledge and experiences should be considered if necessary. Then, MAF requests users to finalize and submit an information form to MAF after prior consultation. And MAF announces the contents of the information form on the website. We accept information that may cause an unfair profit or disadvantage for the user when it is announced. Next slide, please. It is the format of the information form. There are 10 items. And number one, name and summary of the organisms obtained by genome editing technology. The name and summary of the granted characteristics are described. And number four, the fact that the organisms do not contain extracellularly processed nucleic acid or any replicated products thereof specified in Article 2, Paragraph 2, Item 1 of Cartagena Act. Information indicating that the organism is not subject to the Cartagena Act is described. This item is divided in two parts to indicate it indicates that the organism is not subject to the Cartagena Act in detail. Next slide, please. And number five, taxonomic species of the modified organisms. Information on modified organisms is described. Next slide, please. And number seven, modified gene and its function. Cleavage site on the, on the genome. Modified gene information and theoretical changes in traits are described. Number eight, changes of traits introduced by the not modification. Actual changes in traits are described. Next page, please. And number nine, whether there are any changes of traits of other than eight, eight above, and intentional changes. Uh, of target will be discussed later. Number 10, discussion on possible adverse effects on biological diversity through the use of the, the organisms. Discussion on potential impact on, to biodiversity is described. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll explain four points to confirmation in prior consultation. First, we confirm the organisms do not contain extracellularly processed nucleic acid or any replicated product thereof specified in Article 2, Paragraph 2, Item 1 of Cartagena Act. Secondly, we confirm characteristics obtained by genome editing technology and whether there are any unintended change in traits other than objective traits, including the, the effect on of off target off target off target is existence of similar sequence to the target sequence finally 
we check possibility on the effects on biodiversity. This is the same as the item confirmed in the assessment of error mode. Next slide, please. I'll introduce about uh, genome editing high GABA tomato. As a first case, in December 2020, Mark accepted and announced the information form of the tomato with a mutation in a GABA uh, synthetic enzyme gene using genome editing technology. Next slide, please. And for your reference, I'll share a link to the English translation of Cartagena Act. So please look, take a look if you have a time. Uh, thank you wind, for your begin winding up now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Ah, with perfect timing. Thank you very much, Nakamura. <laughs> that was great. Uh, and I really appreciated that was a really nice scene setting of uh, the background and then how you guys are actually approaching some of these gene edited uh, products. Um, and, and great to see, you know, the kind of process that we from outside of Japan will be expected to um, interact with when we, we come around to these products. Um, next, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sashinban D. Um, he's uh, from the Animal Biotech uh, Center, the National Dairy Research Institute in Kamal in India. He's a principal research scientist in animal biotechnology, and, uh, and he's had extensive research experience in animal biotechnology, has many patents um, on developed biotechnology tools, and is looking at uh, improvement of livestock in cows, buffaloes, goats, and sheep. So, uh, Dr. D, over to you. I think you may still be on mute. Okay. Yep, that's good. And you can go into presentation mode on your slide. That'd be great. Yeah. Swapped it. Yep, perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to present a little bit about what is uh, going on in Indian perspective. So to brief in a nutshell, what are the animal we are working on these genome modification? They are buffalo, goat, sheep, and poultry. And mostly scientists are working on the gene pathway. They are QTL, maybe affecting QTL, or example of such type of QTL is BNPR1B in case of sheep and goat to increase the fecundity. Another important is myostatin to increase the muscle mass. And we are in the cell culture and animal cloning stages and not yet produced as such with uh, genome modified animal. So uh, mostly we are working on the fibroblast culture so that we can able to go for biallelic change and then by somatic cell nuclear transfer, it will be modified to pick a complete animal or we can go for zygote. We are approaching both the uh, approaches being conducted in our laboratories in zygote to change the biallelic mode and then it will be complete animal will be made out of that. So some issues are there, different laboratories, they are struggling with different types of uh, problem with such kind of uh, work. They are monoallelic, biallelic to find out their uh, deletion in the genome and the screening process and cell line, whether we are going for a cell line or complete animal, whether the cells are somatic cell or the stem cell, or it is we are going for the zygote or the single cell. So mostly they, we are working on the CRISPR-Cas based either in the ribonuclear protein or in the vector based at all. So these are the some example how we are uh, working at different level. So and in cell culture level, we are trying to knock down this, uh, knock out this thymidine kinase gene in the vero cell for the production of virus culture. And then DHK21, another host cell to increase the multiplication of FMD virus vaccine. And this uh, another way of doing it in the PPR for all these three and the top, they are working on this vi um, virus production on the vaccine production level. And then to find out the biological pathway, how they are going to uh, play a role in the pathway, a particular gene, how they are playing role in the pathway. So they, they are the uh, 
one is the reproduction pathway the egr1 in prostaglandin 2 alpha in case of corpus luteum how they are playing role and uh, bovine herpes virus and targeting a particular gene how we are going to make a particular vaccine which would delete a gene and uh, some work is being initiated to produce a double muscle knockout livestock in case of cattle goat and sheep recently started and we will be going for that and knockout in the chicken or genome editing to augment the productivity in poultry and value added uh, eggs say for example low cholesterol egg so these are the i think yesterday their presentation it was told that in case of crispr it should be supported by proper reproductive technologies to make it successful for a uh, young animal so all this technology i think uh, the somatic cell nuclear transfer is taken lead in this particular type and our uh, national dairy research institute uh, ndri karnal haryana uh, in india they are taking lead in this particular aspect and we are working on the water buffalo which is uh, present in the india nepal bhutan cambodia thailand it is used for meat animal as well as meat milk purpose so these are the different cloning calf generated in our laboratory in our uh, institute so by using somatic cell nuclear transfer 2009 10 13 14 and 15 and still it is uh, we are continuing this is the latest one the top figure is the donor bull use this one and another clone bull is being uh, uh, generated out of that that all has been by the somatic cell nuclear transfer so we are uh, using this particular technology crispr is being uh, used same thing in case of uh, same crispr we are trying for a qtl in case of sheep and goat to increase the fecundity two genes are being uh, targeted for this bmpr one b to increase the follicles number of follicles so that fecundity will be number of offspring will be more this is a fake b mutation and it is going to increase thoroughly associated with the ovulation rate and litter size in case of sheep as it is known long back so these are the some of the example of uh, publication regarding this uh, role of bmp1 b in case of goat by using crispr and another disease resistant the indian animals they are known for the disease resistance so we are trying to explain the pathway how exactly they are going to playing role so this antiviral activity we are trying to knock a particular pathway gene so the one and how important it is is it possible to induce antiviral immunity by using small molecule so this pathway we are explaining by crispr cas and trying to generate a molecule so that the antiviral immunity can be stimulated in the animal so next uh, this is myostatin i think uh, all of you study also lot of animals people have shown so sdn1 this is under sdn1 category <clears throat> so we are trying to generate in case of buffalo sheep and goat so this particular uh, work project is started just now and we are already some cells are being modified by allylic form so we are trying to generate the somatic cell nuclear transfer way to generate the double muscle buffalo as well as sheep and goat this is the thanks for your attention and this is all about whatever it is happening in indian context thank you very much that was uh, great it's a really good oversight of um uh quite a wide range of research activities and all of which point very much in the direction of things that we uh are discussing and considering here um i'll quickly uh reach out to ola we had the opportunity to introduce dr lai's presentation from yesterday and it seems um given the nature of uh dr d's presentation that it might be a good opportunity to um wrap that talk in ola if you're there if we yes, can yes yes uh, that is actually the plan so uh, we yep. would like to request dr lai and ej is going to share the uh, video or the recording of the powerpoint and then uh, we can have the q and a afterwards and also uh, to get everybody uh, in session 4 since yesterday and today yep. to for the discussion Okay, so let's uh, call in uh, Dr. Lai, please, and then EJ will share the recorded PowerPoint. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liang Xiaolai. 
from Jilin University, China. Today, my talk topic is state of genetically modified pigs for agriculture in China. Pork is the main meat food in China, accounting for more than 65%. China consumes more than half pork of the world. The world consumes about 1.4 billion pigs each year, and China consumes about 0.7 billion pigs each year. According to Chinese population, each two Chinese will eat one pig each year. <laughs> However, China has no native breeds of pigs with high productivity. So China every year imports more than 20,000 alien birds from other countries, mainly from North America, including the USA and Canada. Chinese government attached great importance to generation of genetically modified pigs yuan with a favorable tree for agriculture. Chinese government had made effort to set up national special fund for transgenic livestock, set up big pig facility for large-scale characterization of GM pigs. And in China, there are more than 15 research teams working on GM pigs. The genetic modification of pigs can be made to promote growth, improve meat quality, reduce environmental emissions, gain resistance to passenger or other environmental stress. The first application of genetic modification is to promote growth. The first transgenic peak made for promoting growth is by overexpression of growth hormone. In this transgenic peak, significant improvement in both daily weight gain and feed efficiency, as well as a marked reduction in subcutaneous fat has been observed. However, in this peak, many abnormal phenotypes also have been observed, including ulcer, stomach, arthritis, kidney disease, and infertility, etc. There are Chinese team in 2015 they made a transgenic peak with a controllable expression of growth hormone. They put a Chadian system in the peak to regulate growth hormone expression. In this way, the peak can grow normally, and we also can see some improvement in growth rate and efficiency. But the improvement is not so, not so striking as that achieved by directly overexpressing growth hormone. Another peak made for promoting growth is editing Poisson IGF-2 regulator elements to improve meat production in Chinese Bama pigs. IGF-2 is an important growth factor which affects the skeletal muscle and the fat deposition. In IGF-2 inter-3, there is a G. This G will re be recognized by repressor ZBDE6, which 
negatively regulated the IGF-2 expression. If we replace G with the other nucleotide or remove it, then the expression of IGF-2 will be increased. In founder and the F1 gene edited peaks, the bot weight, castle weight, limb weight increased, and the size of myofiber also increased. The second application of GM peak is to improve the peak meat quality. Our earlier study showed that expression of FDA2 in transgenic pigs promotes synthesis of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Mammalians lack the desaturates required for synthesis of polyunsaturated fatty acids, but the plant have this kind of enzyme. So the in this study, F D2 are delta 12 fatty acid desaturates from split was transferred to the pig, and the pig express the polyunsaturated fatty acids like omega 6 fatty acids. Another study showed that transfer fat one gene into the peak. The peak can switch omega-6 fatty acids to omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids is a necessary fatty acid for mammalian development and growth. So this a transgenic pig meat is called healthy meat. Recently, a Chinese team made a transgenic pigs called expression fat one and fat two in pigs. In these pigs, the indigenous produced omega six was used as a substrate to synthesize omega-3 fatty acid. So the pork from the pigs will be more nutritious. Our challenge team also made myostatin aided pigs to overcome numbness and sustainably improve nutritional meat production. Myostatin is a gene negatively regulated the skeletal muscle cell proliferation. At the beginning experiment, they added the axon 3 of myostatin, but this peak got some abnormal phenotype, like hind limb weakness. The peak cannot stand it, so it's not marketable. Then they added X1 instead of X3. So these pigs grow normally. And they show similar fit conversion rate show as the wild type. And they no dystocia or significant effects on maternal reproductive Treat has been found. We can see the muscle of the pig increased and the fat rate decreased in this pig. So the meat quality has been improved in this genetic editing pigs. The third application of GM pigs is to reduce environmental impact. Only one third of feed nutrients and phosphorus were utilized 
from feedstock diets in pig production. Inefficient feed digestion can cause serious nutrient invasion to environment. Phytates negatively charge the saturated sickening acid, bound to positively charge the molecules in, di in diets such as minerals and protein, thereby reduce nutrient digestibility and uh, increase discharge of unabsorbed nutrients to the environment. In addition, pigs are inherently incapable of digesting non-starch polysaccharides that are primarily present in plant cell walls. In an early study conducted by a Canadian team, they made a pig salivary gland specific expression fatty the phosphorus passes on digested most important manual protein. Fatties allow the pigs to digest the phosphorus in fatty. So the total phosphorus content in physical matter decreased significantly. A Chinese team made a transgenic pig which expressed three microbial enzymes, beta-glucanase, xylenase, and fetus in the salivary glands. These three transgenic pigs display increased nutrient digestibility and decreased nutrient output in physics. The growth performance also be improved in these pigs. The first application of GM pigs is to make stress-resistant pigs. This can be done by overexpressing endogenous resistant gene or introducing exogenous resistant genes or editing passing genes targeting receptor gene or introducing synthetic virus killing genes. A Chinese team made a, a depolegatin UCP1 knocking transgenic peaks, which can resist the cold temperature. Peak knock a functional UCP1 gene, resulting poor thermal regulation and the susceptibility to cold. So the peaks they produced the exhibited improved thermal regulation and they decrease the fat deposition and they increase the adipotose nepotosis. The genetic modification also can be used to produce antibacterial transgenic peaks. Nestle then has broad spectrum antibacterial activities. Nestle has been transferred to the pig milk. The transgenic pig milk can inhibit the growth of E. coli in the dual genome of sucking pigs. Another antibacterial transgenic pig is Posan beta deficient 2 transgenic pigs. Posan beta deficient 2 can against the actinobacillus plural pneumonia. The overexpression of POSA beta deficient 2 enhances resistance to this bacteria. Genetic modification also can be used to produce antivirus transgenic pigs. Antivirus transgenic pigs include broad spectrum antivirus 
and the specific antivirus. The broad spectrum antivirus transgenic peak made in China include transgenic peaks over expression mix of virus. This peak can resist the many virus, including influenza A and the classical swine fever. The second broad spectrum and the viral transgenic peak is the one over expression drug. These transgenic peaks can enhance classical swine fever virus and the PR virus resistance. The third broad spectrum antivirus transgenic peak is gene editing peaks, which could enhance NLRP3 expression during the inflammatory stimulation. To make a specific viral resistant peaks, if you know the entry receptors of a virus, you can just knock out the receptor. Then the virus is not able to enter the cell. In China, a team have made a peak strain which knock out the virus entry receptor CD163 and the PAPN. This peak are resistant to PERV and the TGEV and the PDCLV. If you don't know the receptor of a virus, you can use the SIHRNA message to get the virus, specific virus uh, resistant peaks. So in China, they have made the classical swine fever resistant peaks through locking in SIHRNA. And the food and the mouse disease virus and the poison cycle virus type 2 into the peaks to produce the specific viral resistant transgenic peaks. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lai. That was um, terrific. <laughs> Again, a very broad range, this time with um, just the one species, but a broad range of very interesting uh, applications that um, are coming through from gene technology, including gene editing and, and transgenics. So um, we'll um, now move to question and answer session, which will be, um, I think, somewhat mixed because we have um, both some regulatory uh, considerations and also um, uh, some technical um, input there, which was really nice. So I invite the panelists, uh, the people who are presenting today to come back on, turn your video on and um, come out of mute and we'll field some of the questions um, that we've been receiving. So, uh, and also please do keep posting up questions uh, as we go through. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a question, Kind of relates is a living modified organisms um, and the the CBD um, uh, considerations that are taken in Japan and um, there was a a question about the complexity of um, the assessment for impacts of of agricultural animals because the the competitive advantage and predatory parasitic growth kind of considerations that are in there. Um, they're very specific to something that is going to have an impact on other animals in the wild. Agriculture already has a defined place. So are there any additional considerations? So this is to Dr. Uh, Mr. Nakamura, any additional considerations with regards to that classification of, um, of a living modified organism, something that's transgenic, an animal in livestock situations in Japan? Uh, Dr. Nakamura, are you there? You, you're still on mute in case you're um, responding to us.
and I, yep, we're still not hearing you, so it may be that you are on mute or have, um, have lost your connection. Um, he's there, he's there. So, so I'll move on to another um, question then. This is uh, to, um, oh, ah, okay. No, I'm not okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Yep. I think there we go. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. And, and uh, we uh, we evaluate and case by case assessment. So, uh, but. Um, Yeah, it's really if if there's anything different that you consider because of uh, the Cartagena Protocol Convention on Biological Diversity, agricultural animals will already sit within a contained space. I guess is the 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 background of this. So the complexity of their interaction in a living environment is reduced just by being agricultural. Do you see there being any issue? Or how that's assessed is that is it assessed differently because it's an agricultural animal? Is it okay to answer by email later? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. And we do uh, have a number of questions here. We understand there may be com complexities in those, and <laughs> and also you may want to actually look at the background. Um, it, so it, I'll throw it, in a question. Yeah, I, I'll throw in a question. Then I was very pleased to see that um, the the regulatory system in Japan. Uh, offers or, or even asks for a, a prior consultation, which is, is a, a great idea. And it's, I think, being encouraged globally. But do you have a, a, an idea of the timelines, how long it takes, how long you expect to do prior consultation, how long an assessment takes? Is there a time limit or is it just open-ended? We will we, uh, we evaluate, so case-by-case -case assessment. So, uh, uh, there is no time, right? Right. Uh, yep. Yeah. No, okay. So it's it's just worked through on a case by case. Some countries have time limits from when a an application goes in, um, which gives some certainty um, to producers or people trying to put things through. Um, I switch then to um, to Dr. D. There was a question about um, uh, the the rate of success that you have in cloning of buffaloes. Um, how's that look? It's written in the uh, <clears throat> slide is less than five percent. If you have a skillful hand from the blastocyst to living animal, from <laughs> blastocyst to living animal, it is less than five percent. Depending on the skill you have and how quickly you can able to process the things in time. Yeah. Okay. So it's. It's reasonable, it's acceptable, but yeah, still yeah. not on the high side, yeah. Um, there was another question um, that, that was kind of related to that. It's, um, for India, what, what's the status of the, the SDN1, the, the kind of CRISPR knockout versus something that's transgenic compared to say the declaration that um, Mr. Nakamura described for Japan? We are just, it's for me. Yes, yeah, for, for Dr. D in India, how? How is in SDN India, one approach? In animal, we are mostly just started the work, not yet produced any animal of this kind uh, by using this SDN one. All are in cell culture based. <clears throat> for explaining a pathway, but not exactly the live animal we have produced till so far by using CRISPR. Right. Um, uh, I have uh, another question actually for, for uh, the Mr. Nakamura, which is um, about, uh, uh, the success of animal biotechnology in um, in Japan. Have you yet received any uh, inquiries or pre consultations? You may not be able to disclose what they are, but um, is is that happening in Japan at the moment? Uh, sorry, Arno, I I can't answer. Uh, confidential. Confidential information. So. Yeah. 
yeah. No, we understand that. To, to, uh, I, I wonder if cheekily we can assume that means that you may have applications that have been presented. You can't tell us what, but there have been applications for animal biotechnology. Yeah, that, that's fair enough. We understand. We, we wouldn't want to ask details specifically. Um, so uh, actually now there's a question for Dr. Lai. Again, really, yes. really a great presentation. Um, the question is um, around the uh, concerns that might be raised about um, genetically modified pigs for, for food in China. What's the, what's the situation? What, how is that being dealt with and received? Okay, so in China, the government has supported the uh, genetic modification of pig and put a lot of money in the last uh, 10 years. But uh, the regulations so far, I think it's zero. And the scientists in China try to push the government to uh, make the regulation to accept the, the pig go into the market. But you know, in China, the public is very conservative to the GMO. And the, the government faces the public pressure, so they, 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 they can. Then to do anything about that, this is a, even more serious, I think, than in Europe. So they oh. just want to say, we made something and there, and we just wait to say what will happen in the world. Then maybe they, they can make decision in future. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. Thank you. That, that was a, a very interesting answer and that to, to characterize it as being uh, even equivalent to, but possibly more so than Europe is um, is interesting because we can see, you know, some great advances you've made there technically in what's possible with the pig. And, and clearly the pig is a, a very important animal. Um, uh, yeah, the, so there was a, a joint question that was, you know, does it seem likely any of the pig lines that you've described will make it into food production in the foreseeable future? I, I, I don't uh, see... Uh, in the near future, it will be accessible in yeah. China. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. interesting. And that, that's something I guess our whole field considers is yeah. that we can, there are things we can do technically, even with regulation improving the passage through. But if the public aren't ready for it, that, that's the problem. And so finding things that the public want us to do with this technology is, is key. Yeah, OK, that, that's really good. Um, uh, I'm just taking a look and seeing. Um, yeah, someone actually said um, that the, I guess, again, with the, the pig work, Dr. Lai, that, that um, it seems that the gene editing research for disease resistance might eventually replace vaccines. Do you think that's a possibility? Yes, I think so. Uh, if we, you know, like, like if we uh, delete the intra receptor of virus, this then maybe the, this pig can be, yeah, uh, uh, the, 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 replace the vac vaccination with this transgene. Uh. And I know this is gonna throw lots of questions uh, your way, um, but I mean, like, again, it's something that relates perhaps to the public perception, the, the huge impacts we saw recently in China of, um, African swine fever, is that likely, you know, the, the, the potential for the technology to stop the, the need for mass slaughter, the loss of production and loss of, of, of uh, economic values? Is that um, something that might drive the public to see the value in this? That, that you know, something like disease resistance we have already seen in the field is a, a, an attractive topic to, to address for the public, making animals better and less susceptible to disease. Do you think that's a possible driver? Yes, in China, actually now, we also put up a lot of money on the uh, African uh, uh, favor, uh, so yeah. I favor uh, in vaccine. But uh, they also support the genetic, uh, genetic modification of pig to resist this virus. Actually, I know several groups are doing that now. They try to find the, the receptor, interceptor of the virus. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, 
uh, last uh, two years, the Africans survive, uh, survive fever, uh, made very, very big loss in Chinese uh, per se in this trade. And maybe 40% loss, that's a huge, actually. Yeah. So if we can make this peak to resist the, this virus, maybe the, we are changing the public attitude yeah. about the, 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 the genetically modified animals. Yeah, yeah. and particularly, um, you know, maybe uh, the, the, the use of, you know, removal of a, a segment rather than something transgenic. So less, mm. it's just less in the animal that stops the virus might be a good yeah. direction. Yeah, that, that's yes. great. In relation to that, I mean, this was a sort of a spin back question uh, to, to Dr. D um, in India, just with regards to, you know, what the, the, his feeling about the current state of regulation. It's a similar thing. I think, you know, Dr. Lai has done a, a great deal of work on pig. Um, your institute has obviously done a, a lot of work across other species, buffalo and, um, and goats and, and uh, poultry. What do you think the, your perception currently of the state of regulation of animal biotechnology in India is and the likelihood of, of, of products that you're, you're actually developing, they're making it into uh, agricultural production and food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You are correct. <clears throat> in animal science, we are just, uh, the, law, uh, the laws or these uh, regulations are being framed right now. It is not in place. That's because we do not have the genetically modified organism by CRISPR method. We are having a little bit of SDN1 type, cleaving a gene, say for myostatin. That also we have not yet produced. It is in the process. Hopefully, within a year or two, we are going to have modified organism. And regarding the question raised by, I think the Buffalo project is going on here. Just We are just using SCNT process to multiply our high value germ plasm. It may be bull, it may be cow. Yeah. So you, you are hopeful that uh, particularly the, at least SDN1 will, will yeah, receive yeah. Hopefully uh, they will favorable allow for... regulation. Yeah. Regarding this, we are testing for the next generation regarding fertility status and they are all uh, genetic uh, makeup, any off-target effect, any kind of epigenetic modification that we are uh, currently working on. Yeah. so that we can able to support with everything data that they are as such with the whatever animal we have used their cell or nucleus. So um, just to wrap up, I'll, I'll wrap up then and we'll, we'll move to our next session. Um, uh, we heard from Dr. Lai, the, 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 the public attitude in China. Um, I'll, I'll ask both uh, Japan and India. So, so Dr. D, what's your perception of the public's um, likely reception of these technologies, food produced using these technologies in India? This is very difficult to answer right now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it will take some time along with the many people they are in against and they are uh, in favor of this thing. So depending on the product, product we are going to generate, that will be answered along with time. It's very difficult to predict at this stage. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ms. Nakamura, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, this is just a personal opinion. What are your thoughts on, on your sense of the, the public's attitude to this technology in Japan? Uh, I think same as India and China. Uh, it's difficult to uh, answer for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so I think we are now ready for our next session. And um, for that, I hand over to, um, to my colleague, uh, Dr. Halliman, to introduce our next speakers. Hey, thank you, Mark. Uh, we come now to sessions five and six. Now, we've heard of progress and policies on animal biotech in several Asian and Oceania countries. And we turn now to some more topical talks on the sorts of issues that those policies are intended to address. Um, we have two really well-respected scientists to explain those to us. So first we'll hear about food and feed safety assessment of biotech animals from Lisa Kelly. Uh, Dr. Lisa Kelly is a principal scientist in the microbiology and biotechnology section of Food Standards Australia New Zealand or FSANS and has over 20 years experience 
and genetically modified food regulation. She oversees the assessment of applications for the approval of GM foods in Australia and New Zealand, along with FSANS's strategic projects related to biotechnology, including work on new breeding techniques. Lisa regularly represents the Australian government on GM food matters and is a longstanding member of the Bureau of the OECD Working Group on the Safety of Novel Foods and Feeds. Lisa previously led the Australian delegation to the CODAX Ad Hoc Intergovernmental Task Force on Foods Derived from Biotechnology. She's also participated in two FAO WHO expert consultations on GM animals. Lisa? Thank you, Eric, for the introduction. Let me just um, share my screen. So we are changing tack a little bit uh, to go into some of the details of the food and feed safety assessment approach um, that um, can be applied to um, biotech animals. Uh, just to briefly go over what I'm going to cover in this presentation, um, I'll start with a little bit of background, um, cover some of the key concepts and principles um, associated with this particular approach to um, assessment. Um, delve into um, some of the details of the um, assessment itself and the, the, um, the various um, areas that um, it considers, and then talk a little bit about um, uh, actually applying that approach in practice and, um, and in particular focus on some of the areas where that may be simplified or streamlined. So uh, I think the, the the first point really to make when we talk about um, food and feed safety assessment of biotech animals is that um, globally there is not a lot of regulatory experience in this area, um, and that includes in Fazans. Um, most of the regulatory experience um, in assessing these sort of products um, is plant products, not animal products. And one of the main reasons um, for the um, uh, limited regulatory experience is that there simply isn't many examples out there. Um, there's really only two, and we heard um, about those two yesterday, which was the, the salmon and the pig. There are obviously um, a number of um, edited animals um, that are in, in the process of being developed and commercialized. Um, and the assessment approach I'm going to be talking about can also be applied to that, that group of biotech animals. Um, however, important to point out that um, in some countries, at least, um, um, genome edited animals um, may not be classified as GMOs and therefore may not be um, required to undergo any formal pre-market um, safety assessment. So uh, just to start with a little bit of background on the um, approach itself and um, its, um, its origins, where it actually came from. So the approach that, that is um, typically applied uh, to these types of products is based on um, concepts and principles that were developed at an international level um, through a consensus um, process. Um, Originally, this was done through bodies like the FAO WHO and the um, OECD, and um, these um, bodies produced a number of foundational uh, documents, um, for example, the OECD Blue Book, um, which was published in 1986, um, as well as various um, um, expert consultation reports from FAO WHO. Um, the first of which I believe was published in 1991. So the, the concepts and principles um, actually go back quite a long way and um, were quite groundbreaking at the time. Now, these earlier documents have since been supplanted by the codex guidelines, which were developed over a 10 year period between 1999 and 2009 um, through two ad hoc intergovernmental task forces, which were chaired by Japan. Um, these, the codex guidelines that were developed were informed by a number of um, specific um, FAO WHO expert consultations that were convened uh, specifically for that purpose. Um, and those consultations focused on, um, there was one on plants, one on allergenicity, one on microorganisms and two on animals. Now these guidelines were primarily developed for food safety assessment. 
Um, but the same approach, of course, um, can be applied to feed assessment, although obviously in that case, um, the emphasis or the focus would primarily be on um, animal health and safety. So there are four codex documents that are relevant here. Um, the, um, there's the overarching uh, risk analysis, um, uh, principles for risk analysis document, which applies across plants, animals and microorganisms. And then there's the three guideline um, documents. Um, the animal guideline um, was the last to be developed. Now, these, um, um, the purpose of developing these guidelines was to, um, to um, encourage um, international harmonisation in how the safety assessment to these types of products is applied um, across the world. Um, typically, um, what happens is that um, most countries, most um, assessment agencies have their own uh, national guidelines, um, which typically um, um, uh, are developed um, um, or based on um, um, the codex guidelines. Um, what we find, however, is that in developing national guidelines that are based on the codex guidelines, there are um, differences that, that sometimes occur um, between countries um, um, so that each country's appro um, approaches are not necessarily always identical. Um, and sometimes there can be differences in how the approach itself may be applied in practice. So just to talk about some the basic approach to assessment, just at a very high level, um, and just a few things that I, I want to emphasise, which are quite important or fundamental to, to the approach and how it's applied. Firstly, um, um, the, the approach itself, um, which is enshrined in the codex documents, is designed to be flexible and applied um, in a case by case manner. So in other words, um, whilst the guidelines themselves set out um, core um, information that is typically required for, for, for assessments, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, all of that information um, is, is mandatory for every single assessment. So adjustments can be made depending on the type of food being assessed and the specific type of modification or trait that has been introduced. Fundamental to the approach is uh, comparison to a conventional counterpart with a history of safe use. Um, it's very, um, the, the, the comparator, it's very important that that um, animal does have a history of safe use because essentially you're using that animal as the benchmark for what is considered safe and against which the modified animal will be compared. Um, the, the purpose of the comparison uh, is to identify anything that may be different um, between um, the modified animal and the comparator. And those differences then become the focus of further assessment. Having differences themselves is not necessarily any, um, raises any safety concern, but it just tells you where to focus your assessment and then and consider whether any of those differences may potentially um, introduce new or altered um, hazards into the food products. The um, assessment is um, intended to focus um, not only on the intended um, changes to the animal, but also any unintended changes. Um, and in the codex documents, um, there's actually quite a lot of emphasis um, on um, unintended changes and various studies and approaches um, that um, may be used to determine if any of these have occurred. Um, I think um, that emphasis in these documents probably dates them a bit. Um, I think um, 20 years after the fact, we, we probably have a, a slightly different view um, about unintended effects, although um, certainly many in the um, many members of the public still have heightened concerns about unintended changes. Um, the, the final point to emphasise uh, in the general approach is that um, decisions about safety or conclusions about safety um, should be based on the totality of the evidence. So there's no single study that, um, that you can do that will tell you that the food is safe. So it's, it's the evidence um, derived from a number of pieces of information or studies, um, which together um, um, allows you to reach a conclusion about the safety of the food. So this is um, the components or the elements of the assessment in a bit more detail. I'm not intending to um, 
go into this in a huge amount of detail. Um, this, this pretty much outlines, outlines the general approach and it's the same approach that is applied in, to plants as well. Um, there are a few differences between plants and animals, um, which I'll highlight when I just walk through this um, at a reasonably high level, but really the, there's four main components. One is the, um, um, the phenotypic um, considerations um, around the, um, the host animal um, and the modified animal and um, um, the health of the modified animal. Now, this particular aspect of the phenotypic um, considerations is actually specific to the animal guideline. It's something that you don't see in the plant guideline, for example. Um, and the, the reason for that being is that you, we can have very healthy plants, um, but um, those plants can um, contain highly toxic um, substances to both humans and animals. Um, whereas in contrast, um, traditionally a healthy animal um, is generally um, considered safe to eat. And this is particularly the case with um, uh, mammals and poultry and certain fish species. Generally, if there are substances that are produced in animals that would be harmful to humans, um, there is a, a good chance that they would also affect the health of the modified um, animal. So this is considered um, is it was an additional element that was added into the safety assessment approach that is not seen in the plant guideline. Um, obviously, the, the molecular characterization part of the assessment um, can be quite important, um, particularly in terms of how the, the assessment, the rest of the assessment might be framed, because obviously through that characterization process, you find out um, what exactly um, um, has been introduced um, into the genome or changes to the genome that, that have been made, and in particular, whether any new substances might be expressed. Um, so this can help you frame um, the rest of the assessment as well as um, um, also inform um, the uh, identification of any new or altered um, hazards. Uh, the assessment of new substances, um, this in particular with, with transgenic animals, for example, will focus on primarily focus on um, any new proteins that may be produced, um, in particular um, an assessment of their potential toxicity or allergenicity. Um, but obviously there, there may be other non-protein substances that could be introduced, for example, into furin RNA. Um, one of the differences between um, in this aspect between the plants and animals is the um, idea of bioactivity uh, in relation to expressed substances. Um, because of um, often there may be um, uh, shared um, physiology between humans and, and certain animal species that are being modified. If, for example, there's a hormone that has been uh, expressed in a, in a modified animal, it would be important to establish that that hormone is not going to have any effects um, in the human following consumption of, of the food from that animal. The final part of the assessment focuses more on the whole food. And the main component of this um, is, um, the comp is compositional analysis of the food products. Um, however, this may, um, additional assessments may also be done um, if there has been um, significant changes to the nutrient composition, in, in which case an assessment of the nutritional impact of those changes may be warranted. Um, in terms of the compositional analysis, um, this is an aspect of the assessment that can be quite challenging for animals compared to plants. And it's certainly something that is acknowledged um, in the codex guideline, um, just sim for very simple practical reasons of, of um, not being able to um, um, have at hand a lot of um, samples um, and also not necessarily being able to have closely matched comparators. Um, and so it can be difficult to, um, to um, generate a, a meaningful amount of, of data in which to undertake an assessment. Um, the way that this can be um, compensated for, however, is by also um, considering the comp any, what compositional data there is in the context of the, um, the data that has been um, collected in relation to the health status of the animal. So in terms of applying the approach, um, just three points I just want to emphasize. Um, it is designed for food from animals with a history of safe use. Um, and that is really important. If an animal um, has been modified 
um, that is a, a, a species that is not one um, that has a history of safe use as food, um, then this type of com comparative approach may not be a valid one. <laughs> and it, it may be necessary to actually do an assessment from first principles rather than using this type of approach. Um, this approach um, has also been does, designed primarily for animals bearing heritable recombinant DNA constructs or transgenic animals. Um, however, um, as I alluded to earlier, it could be adapted to apply to um, products from animals altered using other techniques such as genome editing um, with, with um, certain modifications um, being made to take account of, um, um, for example, the absence of if there are no new um, newly expressed proteins, for example. So in terms of streamlining uh, the approach, so um, I've mentioned that the approach is, is was intended and designed to be implemented and applied in a flexible way. Um, and to really be adjusted at, depending on um, the type of modification that's been introduced and the type of food that you're assessing. Um, implicit in this flexibility is that um, the data requirements that are, are actually outlined in, in the codex documents, for example, um, may need to be adjusted. Um, and certainly some parts of that may not be relevant to the case in question um, that is being assessed. Um, and so in that situation, it's perfectly acceptable to omit um, certain parts um, of, of, the, um, of, the, of the data requirements that are outlined. Um, it may not necessarily, and, and of course the, the, the codex documents are guidelines, they're not intended to be um, written in stone or, or mandatory, they are um, just guidelines, um, but of course at the national level it may depend on, on how um, the national guidelines have been developed and what flexibility they may, there may be within specific um, regulatory frameworks and within, and, and, and within the policy context of, of, rel of the particular assessment agencies as to how much flexibility there may be there. Um, one of the issues with um, applying the approach in, an, uh, in a flexible way and to introduce steam, um, um, streamlining measures or simplifications where necessary is because there isn't a lot of um, hands-on experience with these types of products, um, um, uh, particularly animal ones, sometimes it can be difficult to know um, without having that um, experience um, um, where it's appropriate to, to um, apply um, streamlining. Um, and, and this can be very much a matter of judgment um, based generally on, on experience. So some of the areas um, of the assessment that may be simplified um, and once again, um, and this, this is often the case um, in, in uh, applying the assessment to plant products, is if you've already assessed similar products before, it may be the same trait or, or exactly the same construct that's been used, or it may be exactly um, the, the exact same host animal that was used, um, then, then it's possible to bridge from previous assessments to simplify the next assessment. Um, um, the other issue, uh, the other um, part that, that can be significantly streamlined is, um, which I mentioned before, is the assessment of new substances. If, there, if it's just a simple edit um, and there is no new um, gene that's been introduced, there are no new proteins being expressed, then that um, complete part of the assessment can be omitted. And that, that can obviously save a lot of time. Um, and obviously, um, if it's a trait that has been previously assessed before and you've seen before and you know um, from previous assessments that that trait or that expressed protein is safe, there's no need to repeat that assessment every single time. Um, and, and then also just to refer once again to compositional analyses. Um, this, this can be, this. I sort of think of this as streamlining almost by necessity because you may not actually have a huge amount of compositional data or a huge number of samples to, um, uh, on which to, um, to do a compositional analysis. Um, in that case, um, decisions have to be made, well, um, 
how, how can I compensate for the um, absence of a, a huge amount of compositional data and even ask questions is, is that compositional data critical um, to being able to make a decision about safety? So those are some important things um, to think about. So just to sum up then, um, the safety assessment approach for animals is very similar to plants. Um, However, um, there are very, there's very few examples of um, biotech animals that are being, um, that are around at the moment being used for food or even close to commercialization. And, with, and because of that, there's very limited regulatory experience. Um, some aspects of the safety assessment approach um, can be more challenging um, in relate for animals than it is compared to plants. Um, but um, the approach itself was designed to be applied in a flexible way. Um, and, um, and, and I think in that context, as an assessor, it's really important to always be asking yourself that question. Um, what, what am I actually trying to do with this assessment? Where are the, where are the concerns? Where do I think the concerns are? And, and therefore, what, what information is essential to know in order to be me in order to reach a, um, a sound conclusion um, and do a robust assessment about safety versus what information um, is might be interesting to know or nice to know, but may not necessarily be essential um, for making that final um, judgment about safety. Okay, um, and that's it. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you, Lisa, for a very clear presentation. Um, participants, please put any questions or comments you might have in the question and answer box. Um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit now and we'll start talking of environmental risk assessment for biotech animals. And we'll hear from Dr. Tim Strabla from New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Strabla has more than 20 years of plant molecular biology and biotechnology research and development experience in both the public and private sectors. He's currently a principal scientist in the new organisms team at the New Zealand Environmental Protection Authority, where he evaluates and provides expert staff advice to decision makers on all aspects of the status of organisms as new organisms to New Zealand. This involves both genetically modified and unmodified organisms, containment applications for new organisms, and release applications for new organisms. Uh, this advice includes risk analysis and risk management, as well as the fundamental biology of the organisms. He also provides technical expertise regarding hazardous substances and biotechnology to EPA staff and managers, as well, to, as, well as to other New Zealand government ministries and agencies. Tim. Thank you, Eric, uh, for that introduction. I see if I can share my screen here. Got everything else set up. Hopefully that part will work. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'd just like to give you a little bit uh, about uh, about our application pathways uh, here in, in New Zealand for, for biotech animals. I did want to just say before I get into this, um, I really uh, uh, wanted to thank uh, particularly uh, Diane Ray Kay and, and, and Peter Thigason for giving a pretty decent introduction to a lot of the background uh, around uh, a regulation of, of animal biotechnology. So I won't belabor a lot of those points. Um, I also want to say, um, you know, Lisa's talk was, was also extremely informative. And I just wanted to draw, since I'm, I'm presenting in conjunction with my uh, counterparts across the Tasman Sea, that, um, you know, it, with a with a food approval, um, there is there is harmonized regulation. So an approval in Australia uh, is an approval in New Zealand, but with uh, uh, with OGTR and the EPA, environmental risk assessments don't uh, don't cross the uh, don't cross the Tasman Sea. So there are differences in regulation uh, in envir on the envir environmental side uh, that I'll try to highlight as I as I go along. So. Um, Hang on a second. That's better. Right. So, um, uh, new organisms are what uh, what we regulate uh, at the EPA in New Zealand. And what does that actually mean? Um, 
you know, most organisms have been around for, for quite some time. But these, what we mean by this is uh, new organisms that are new to New Zealand. And the, the photos at the bottom give you some idea of, of why we actually have this legislation. Uh, on the left are some of our, our native species that uh, in the environment uh, that they live in um, that, uh, that we are trying to protect. And on the, on the right-hand side are some of the species that were brought in you know, with, with good intentions at the time, I suppose, earlier in New Zealand's history that have led to a number of environmental problems, particularly uh, for our native bird species, as you can see the, uh, the rat and the, uh, the possum uh, they're uh, munching on, uh, on bird eggs and so forth. So this is, these, these, have, these have caused problems. And so what our organization is about is doing, before any new organism to New Zealand can be introduced, um, they have to be um, fully risk assessed uh, before they can be released. And so they have, people have to make an application to us. We assess it and then decide uh, uh, whether or not to release it and, and under what conditions. And so in the middle, there are the, the species that we actually have outdoor uh, approvals for. None of these are release approvals um, for the cows, goats, and sheep. This is what uh, we call an outdoor uh, a development and containment outdoors. So um, since these are large animals, they need, they need space outdoors, but the, they are still contained. And so, um, and so that's, that's not, in, under New Zealand law, a release. Um, and then the pine trees that you see, this is for uh, Pinus radiata, Monterey pine to Americans. Um, and that is a field test in, in containment. And that's, uh, that's that the, both, both of those uh, 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 projects are, are ongoing. So, uh, so what is actually a GMO under the HASNO Act? Well, a genetically modified organism is something that's had its genetic material modified by in vitro techniques or are otherwise uh, derived or inherited. And so uh, that's a pretty broad definition. Um, and in many ways, it actually covers mutagenesis techniques that were in use well before uh, any, um, any uh, genetic modification was thought of as, as a thing uh, beginning in the 70s, as Peter talked about with the Asilomar conference. And so uh, there are a number of exemptions in, in our regulations under that law uh, as to what is or is not a, uh, a genetically modified organism. Um, now, as, now, as Peter uh, mentioned, you know, the European Court of Justice and, and, uh, and the New Zealand High Court uh, both made decisions as to the GM status of uh, uh, gene editing. Um, I would say that there's some difference there is that the, e the ECJ's interpretation is about the primary law, and it has to do with the length of time that a particular technique uh, has been in use. And so traditional tech mutagenesis techniques are exempt because of the long history of safe use, whereas they judged that uh, gene editing uh, was perhaps uh, with a shorter history, perhaps the safety profiles weren't fully understood. Uh, you can make of that what you will. In New Zealand, it was a slightly different thing. We, because of our regulations as to what's exempted, it was long assumed that uh, traditional forms of mutagenesis were exempt, and uh, certain applications of gene editing were like point, you know, inducing point mutations. And so, EPA uh, in 2013, I believe it was, um, actually said that yes, those those would be like traditional mutagenesis. So the so-called SDN1 techniques. That, uh, that Peter talked about yesterday would be exempt. That was challenged in the high court. The judge didn't rule that gene editing should be considered to be genetic modification, but rather that it did not appear on the list of exemptions and therefore uh, had to be considered a GM regardless. Um, this actually threw some of the other older considerations into a bit of confusion or disarray in that point mutations weren't explicitly, uh, you know, by traditional mutagenesis techniques were also not listed. So that prompted us to undertake in, in conjunction with the Ministry for the Environment here, a review of those regulations. Um, and and uh, similar to what Australia uh, did not too long ago and got approved, um, but there was a cabinet decision made in, in 2015 um, to essentially maintain the status quo. 
So our regulations actually do say that a mutagenesis technique not in use before the 29th of July, 1998 makes GMO. And the significance of that date is simply when that, when those, uh, when that law, part of the law went into effect. And so, um, you know, this, this is under secondary regulation, not the primary law. So there is a bit more flexibility potentially in, in, uh, in future changes to that. So I just wanted to clarify that. I've probably gone on a bit too long about that. So we'll try to catch up. Um, so we have a number of approval pathways uh, that, we, that we can give. And we have given a number for animals for uh, containment approvals, both uh, uh, con containment or, or development approvals for genetically modified um, animals, both large and small. Um, and we can also give uh, an approval for a field trial in containment. We have never done that for, uh, for any animal, but we have done several for, for plants over the years. There's only currently one that I've already told you about that's, that's underway. Um, and so uh, we, we have done release approvals, and what you see in the pictures on the left are uh, you know, basically our, our pictorial representations of, of release approvals that we have done for non-GMOs, and so that's a samurai wasp at the top left there, meant to control the um, brown marmorated stink bug if it ever gets here. Luckily, it has not yet. Um, and on the right is a green shield bug, an Australasian green shield bug, uh, which the uh, samurai wasp does not uh, uh, lay its eggs in. And therefore, uh, it got approval on that basis that it didn't affect native uh, stink bug species. Um, but with GMOs, uh, as with Australia, we have never approved the release of any animal uh, as a GMO uh, into the New Zealand environment. Um, we can, however, do this. Uh, I, I will also say that no one has ever actually applied to do that in New Zealand. So we can do this without controls. That would be an, an unregulated uh, release. Um, we've only ever done that for GMOs that are medicines, and there's only one of those. Um, we can release with controls, um, and that, again, uh, has only ever been used for medicines. And then we have with or without controls uh, for a specific pathway for qualifying organisms, which essentially are the medicines that I was just talking about. Oh. However, those, those pathways are available, and I will talk a little bit more about the controlled <clears throat> releases um, in the context of a full release coming up. We have one other uh, approval that is of interest in terms of uh, what we've been discussing here. It's for gene edited pigs. These are not your ordinary run-of-the-mill pigs. These are actually Auckland Island pigs. Uh, Auckland Island is a very remote island in the Southern Ocean um, that was used as a, as a uh, stopover by uh, whalers way, way, way back in the day, 150 years ago or so. And they actually left pigs on the island. And when whaling uh, declined, they, uh, the pigs remained and the whalers weren't there anymore. So these animals have been feral on that island for about 150 years. Our Department of Conservation is trying to work on restoring that island to a more uh, pre-colonial uh, state. Um, and so these pigs have either been called or some of them have been removed and brought back to New Zealand. And the significance of these animals is that because of their long isolation, they don't have a lot of uh, diseases that other commercially farmed pigs have, uh, particularly porcine endogenous retrovirus, but other viruses as well. And so in the context of gene editing for human organ transplant immunocompatibility, uh, these pigs are being researched uh, and, and developed for that. So um, that, that's ongoing. The outdoor containment approval, these are both done by um, one of our so-called Crown Research Institutes, Ag Research, which is in the central North Island. Um, and they are also working on cows, goats, and sheep, as I've told you. And most of the applications here as well are not for agronomic traits, but for various traits that uh, uh, have potential use in, in medicines themselves or uh, but there are but there are some agronomic ones as well. So you know beta lactoglobulin knocked down for hypoallergenic milk um, and high casing milk as well. So it, it varies, but uh, yeah, and most of that work's being done in, in cows and goats. right? So if you want to make an application for the release of a genetically modified animal, um, it's likely that it will be publicly notified as required under our law. Um, and so uh, conditional release approvals, uh, uh, for new organisms can be are, are required to be publicly notified or the unconditional release as well. 
um, or to release from containment or even a field test. And so this, uh, with genetic modified organisms, these are still uh, considered by some to be a bit controversial. Um, and so I think that has sort of um, made a lot of potential applicants hesitant here in New Zealand. Uh, because uh, one other aspect of the public notification process is that we uh, we ask for submissions, and if any submitter says that they want to be heard on this, then we are required by law to hold a public hearing. And so, um, if even if an applicant, though, even if someone says they don't want to be heard, if somebody actually says that there there must you know that we have to that we have to hold a hearing, then all submitters can can speak should they wish. So um, just some aspects, and, and I guess probably the most important aspects of our risk assessment, I'll, I'll get into uh, uh, um, uh, some, uh, some other aspects of what we actually uh, do look at, but these are sort of what I would call the make or break uh, sort of criteria that we have to face and deal with um, in, in any uh, approval pathway. And so these are the so-called minimum standards, and uh, I won't read them back to you, um, but it's, it's really all about the protection of uh, human health, native species, and, and the environment. Um, and if, if we can't be satisfied uh, that, uh, that those minimum standards can be met, then we are actually required to decline the application. We can't impose controls uh, so this this is a hurdle that has to be gotten over before we can uh, before we can give a, an approval. And again, on the left, uh, a few organisms that are non-GMOs that uh, that have gotten over this bar uh, are, are are shown. So this can be done, but it just simply hasn't been done with a, a genetically modified organism. Um, in conjunction with the minimum standards, the additional matters to be considered, which are also very important, um, we're not required to decline if these can't be met, but these are very important for us to. Uh, uh, have a very close look at because the establishment of undesirable still sustaining populations um, might lead to the ability um, to not meet the minimum standards, but also the ability to eradicate those organisms should that actually happen. So um, to come back to some of the other criteria we look at, we do look at not only at the risks, but also the potential benefits and we're required to do so. And so it's it's really a bit of a, a balancing act, provided that you can meet the minimum standards. So we look at the environmental risk assessment, public health. We've already mentioned those, economic benefit, and that's uh, that's an important one as well. And a good economic benefit case goes a long way. But we also look at societal values in general, and particularly Maori culture. So our law actually requires us to consider the views, uh, perspectives, needs, and protection of. Uh, organisms and environment uh, that are sacred uh, to, to Māori. And so uh, that's, that's a very important part of our consideration. But we weigh up benefits versus risks in all these categories. And uh, if the benefit outweighs the risks, then and only then can, are we allowed to, uh, to give an approval. Right, so just a quick bit on pathways and timeframes here. Um, there are, there are aspects that do have statutory requirements, some aspects don't. Um, and so I start off with what I call the pre-application phase when we receive a draft application. This is an indefinite time period. However, it will be shorter, uh, depend, which depends on the quality of the initial submitted application. So the ability to fully answer the sort of questions on our application form uh, more completely will lead to a, a quicker evaluation and a quicker um, uh, time before we can go to uh, what I call formal receipt. Um, and once that's actually triggered, um, then we have um, uh, a number of steps that we undertake. So we have to do a pathway assessment. So we have non-notified pathways. Um, again, if it's required to be notified, we don't, we can't do that. Um, but we can, there are a number of pathways along the notified side that we might, uh, that we might take it down. And so we have 10 working days to, to deal with that. Um, and then a public notification, if, it's, if we get to that stage and request for submissions, that phase takes 30 working days. Um, and as I say that submitters may request a hearing, which would add further to the time. So we would set a date for a hearing um, and that has to be done within 30 working days of the closing date of the submission to set that, to set that date. 
And then the public hearing, if it is required, uh, is, is undertaken. Um, and that is heard by uh, a, a decision making committee. Um, and uh, if that's, um, once that's done, then that information is, is analyzed and, and um, drafted into a decision and discussion in conjunction with the decision making committee by EPA advisors. And then that decision has to be notified within uh, 30 days uh, uh, of the hearing. So if no hearing is required, the decision has to be considered within 30 days, and then we would uh, publish that decision. Right, so that's a very sort of brief uh, uh, overview. I thought it was gonna be taking more time than I did, so I might've accidentally rushed a little bit, but uh, I that I guess leaves us a little bit more time for questions in the, in the Q&A. So I just wanna say thank you very much and uh, happy to answer any questions. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, in many ways, the environmental risk assessment approach in New Zealand might be a model for many countries in the region. All right, so we come now to the question and answer period, and I'll remind participants they can put their questions in the Q&A, or if you're a member of the organizers, you can put it in the chat. I'm gonna start with one from Alison Van Enodum that's directed to Lisa. Um, the idea of a closely matched contemporary comparator for compositional analysis is problematic for large animal experiments because you may not have an equivalent comparator for a clone, for example. Why not just use the public literature on variation for milk and meat composition as the guide rails rather than having to additionally raise conventional comparator animals, which is expensive. Uh, this would also have benefit in terms of complying with the three R's, reduce, refine, and replace the use of experimental animals? Um, that's a great question. Thank you, Alison. Um, and basically, yes, you can. You can do away with the comparator altogether. Um, the comparator, um, the requirement for a comparator is, is uh, reflective of, um, I guess, some older or early thinking in the codex guideline, which is still there, obviously. Um, the, the way the, com you know, the comparison is done, and it typically in a compositional analysis is you compare your, your, um, your new food to the conventional counterpart, um, um, if there are um, significant, uh, statistically significant differences, you then um, um, refer, you look um, at the, those values in relation to um, what's normally in the food supply, what the literature range is or whatever. Um, it, it's, it, so even if you, you, um, your value is exceeding the, um, um, the values for the comparator, um, often it's within natural variation that you expect for that particular constituent. So in my mind, and this, this is not just in animals, you can um, uh, also um, do this for, for plants. You don't necessarily need the comparator because really what the most important comparison is how it compares to what's um, the, the natural variation already in the food supply. Um, it's, but it, as I said, it's it's just one of those um, things that is that is enshrined in the in the codex approach, and which um, is um, has been translated across into na various national guidelines. That's another, but that is another way of of streamlining the approach for sure, and particularly if that saves costs, which obviously it will, in a lot of cases. Hey Lisa, this brings up a follow up. Um, is there any move afoot? to revisit Codex. It's 20 years old now. Yeah. Um, and how might that be approached? <laughs> so um, I'm not aware of any movement um, internationally or appetite um, to reopen the Codex guideline. Um, I do think it is showing its age. Um, it was developed at a time um, very early on in the in the development in the technology development, um, and only a limited amount of experience in assessment, and things have moved on in that time. Um, so I think it definitely could do with a rethink. Um, how that would or could be done, um, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it would. 
it, it would not be an easy process to open that up um, um, and to go back and um, um, revise the codex guideline. Um, and as I said, I'm not aware that there's any appetite, um, but it's definitely an area that I, for one, would like to see more discussion about uh, internationally. Um, and I, I really think we need to have, you know, based on the experience that most of us now have, particularly in relation to plants, which I also think is relevant to, to animals, um, there are some aspects of that, um, of that approach that we could definitely um, improve. <laughs> For sure. All right. Mm. Fair enough. All right, Tim, you left a loose end in your talk that I want to follow up on. You had mentioned that there's some sensitivity to Maori values in terms of new organisms. How does that apply to GMOs or to new organisms? Um, thanks, Eric. Um, it's a good question, and it's it's becoming increasingly important as, as time goes on. Um, the, the HASNO Act does require that we take uh, Maori values into account um, when evaluating applications. And we actually have a, uh, uh, a Maori uh, team in, in uh, the EPA that assists with that process. And they have contacts amongst Maori uh, across the nation. Um, and there is a group uh, that's known, it used to be known in English as the Maori National Network, it is now called Tiheringa, and that is uh, a group that has interest in genetic modification uh, and new organism release technolo you know, technologies in, in, in general, but GMOs are, uh, can quite often uh, occupy their time. Um, and uh, with that, we're, we're finding that having uh, developing partnership uh, partnerships with Maori uh, when you want to do some sort of genetic modification technology is proving to be extremely useful. Uh, consultation and engagement with Maori um, goes a very long way, and if you have support from uh, from local uh, Maori, if your if your work is in a particular region, or if you want to go nationwide, then you potentially would consult with, with Tugheringa. But developing uh, a relationship with a tribe or a hapu as it's known, or, uh, or an iwi, which is a larger sort of federation, um, is, is very helpful, very useful, and having that kind of support goes an extremely long way in, in, uh, a positive, in getting a positive outcome for, for those kind of applications. All right. Um, Lisa, question for you. What aspects of food safety assessment of biotech animals may be more challenging compared to plants? I mean, wouldn't a lot of aspects be easier for food animals, given that the meat of animals is generally considered safe to eat uh, if the animal's healthy? While there might be many potentially harmful or even poisonous plants. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of the aspects um, should um, should be easier. Um, having said that, I, um, you know, my my background is I've spent two decades being involved mainly in plan assessment, so I always come with that lens. <laughs> um, but the um, we actually make the assessment of plants more difficult than it needs to be. <laughs> um, so, um, 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 but yeah, the certainly with animals we don't have that issue with with um, various toxicants being being present there um, um, but also I mean I think you know in relation to um, the assessment of animal products um, and and this also goes to plants but I'll focus on animals I mean we we have to you know we have to um, remember that we're dealing with animals that um, we have a long experience with in terms of breeding um, so we and um, we've the they've been in our food supply for a long time. Um, so the animals that we're modifying already come with that, you know, that history of safe use. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. But also we have to remember that quite apart from what GM regulations there may be, there are other regulations in place in countries that relate to um, 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 and support um, a safe food supply. And those don't go away simply because an animal has been genetically modified. So they're there always in 
in the background and then help ensure that, that food is safe. Um, really, the GM assessment is really um, something that you overlay on top of those processes. And I guess the question we have to ask, um, uh, to what extent um, is that always necessary to have that, to have that additional overlay? And are the current processes for that we use for to ensure that the products of conventional animals are safe, is that going to be sufficient in a lot of cases? Okay, uh, another question for Tim. Um, are, the are, the, are there any differences between the approval processes for large and small animals? Um, in principle, no. <laughs> um, I think perhaps 10 years ago, um, there were. Uh, because, uh, you know, as I say, that outdoor development uh, approval that we did was publicly notified. Um, and we have never publicly notified any other development approval for, for any other animal species, small animal species. And in fact, that, uh, that pig application for the, um, for the immunocompatibility is one that we actually did under a non-notified uh, rapid approval. Um, and that, that passed through uh, with relative ease. So I do think, you know, um, times have changed. The HASNO Act has not changed much. Uh, like Codex, it's more than 20 years old now. Um, and, but I think, I think public perceptions have changed to a, to a certain extent. And it seems that uh, there's less controversy around these sorts of applications and the uh, the need, you know, some some applications, obviously, we do have to publicly notify regardless. Um, but some we, you know, there are there are those possibilities uh, for development work uh, that wouldn't necessarily be required to be notified as as that ag research approval was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Now. I have a question that's directed to either Peter from the uh, Gene Technology Office or to Lisa. Do you think it's worth highlighting that in Australia? SDN1 has not been considered a GMO under the Gene Technology Act, but may require an assessment by FSANS regarding food safety. Do you want me to answer that, Peter? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to let uh, Lisa answer, perhaps I'll, I'll comment on from an Australian perspective, but I, I might make a a general answer about that, which is a, a riff on the theme that I had yesterday about looking at what the definitions are. Um, so I think what's being referred to there is we have um, slightly different definitions in our two pieces of legislation. And I don't think that's a situation which is unique to Australia. So I think that the theoretical outcome is that you may end up in cases where in one case, the food might be subject to regulation and the organism not or vice versa. So that, that's a kind of theoretical one. Um, but I'll pass over to Lisa, who might have some additional comments on that. Yeah, so uh, in relation to the, the food situation, um, so an SDN1 edited um, animal would not be a GMO in Australia. Um, would be a GMO in New Zealand, though. <laughs> Um, the situation in relation to food is um, a little bit unclear at the moment, and we are in the process of undertaking uh, work to um, revise the, the definitions that we use to determine what is a GM food and therefore subject to a pre-market safety assessment and approval by Fazans. Um, we are intending to shift our current process-based um, emphasis in our definitions over to one that um, uh, is more focused on, on outcomes and product. And as a result of that, um, we won't be making these process-based distinctions between different types of genome editing, for example. Um, so um, what we are intending uh, is to um, uh, or will be proposing, um, and this will be going out for public comment later this month, uh, is that um, products uh, that are produced using these types of technologies that are essentially equivalent um, to what you could produce through breeding um, will be excluded um, from pre-market assessment and approval. Um, so 
um, because of that, what it could mean um, is that there, there may be some edited um, products, including by SD1, that we might, that might actually <laughs> be captured. Um, but equally, there will be others that won't. So, um, okay. yeah. Case by case assessment. Yes. <laughs> Just to okay, add to uh, Peter, there a little bit, we, are, we do have a bit of that disconnect between uh, food and, and uh, uh, environmental risk assessments. There are lots of foods that are legal to be consumed to their GMOs in New Zealand, but you couldn't grow them here. There have been no approvals of those, of those organisms for growth. Okay. Now, Tim, towards the end of your talk, you were talking about the, the, you, that you look also at the potential benefits of a new organism. Mm -hmm. Well, who does the cost benefit analysis? Would it be an economist um, or, and who would pay for that work to be done? Um, yes, there, oftentimes, it, if, if you're talking about economic benefit, um, then uh, you, you know, oftentimes a, 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 an applicant will hire an economist to describe a potential economic benefit case. Um, just speaking from experience, I used to be uh, a researcher um, and uh, worked at, uh, at uh, the, one of the other Crown Research Institutes, Scion and working on genetically modified pine. And that field trial at that time um, did uh, have an economic analysis and that cost was borne by Scion and it was presented by Scion to EPA. Um, but economic benefit is only one aspect uh, of, the, of the case and environmental benefit is obviously uh, very important. And I think an environmental benefit case is probably more important in getting something over the line. Uh, consumer benefit, uh, which tends to economic, but you know, if you have health benefits or something like that with a food that you might want to grow, uh, whether that's a food animal or a food plant, um, that would probably carry quite a bit of weight as well. So it's a, yeah, it's quite the complex mixture, um, but yeah. and, and Generally, those costs are, are borne by the applicant, but on the other side, um, our fees are not all that expensive compared to some of the other costs that would be incurred with that. Okay. Um, in an earlier question, we were talking about some of the issues with doing comparisons of compositional analyses. Uh, this is a question for Lisa, uh, especially because your sample sizes might be large or the animals are valuable in the case of cattle. Um, can animal toxicity testing be used as a substitute for compositional analysis? Um, there are certainly um, some countries where um, animal toxicity testing is included as part of a food safety assessment. It's not something that we do in Fasans um, um, have ever done in fact, or have ever required. My view is that um, no, um, I don't think um, animal toxicity studies would be of value um, generally. Um, you know, I think we have to, <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of times those, those animal toxicity studies are really done um, to provide reassurances around unintended effects. Um, and indeed, that, that's often what the compositional analysis is used for as well. Um, I think we actually need a, um, a, a more rational debate <laughs> around unintended effects <laughs> and the extent to which we need to be um, obsessing with them in terms of our assessment. Um, you know, we, I've been doing involved in this game for a long, long time and many, many, many assessments of plants and um, I haven't seen a single um, unintended change that has raised any safety concerns. Um, so if, if the animal toxicity testing is being done to chase down unintended effects, um, I don't see any value in that. And in fact, um, um, I actually don't think they would necessarily, um, a negative result I actually think is going to be meaningless because I don't think it necessarily would have the sensitivity to pick up any types of changes anyway um, that, that, that may be of concern. So, um, so in short, no. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Um, Tim, a follow-up on the benefits question. You, know, you mentioned that it's not just money, that there could be environmental benefits and such. Is part of the consideration the distributional aspect of it? Who gets those benefits? Right. Um, well, as I, as I already alluded to, uh, direct benefit to the environment uh, is, is also is, is of great help. Um, you know, New Zealand is dealing with a number of diseases to its, its native uh, fauna, uh, flora particularly. I know this is an animal biotech workshop, but I will uh, just give this as an example. Um, one of our most iconic trees, the kauri, which I suppose would be the New Zealand equivalent of a, of a redwood for an American perspective, um, uh, you know, quite big, long-lived majestic trees, but they are suffering from a phytophthora infection that is, that is uh, sort of decimating the population. And there's a lot of discussion going on, you know, similar to what's going on with the American Chestnut Project about, um, you know, potentially doing genetic modification to make quality resistant. I think we've got a long way to go with that, but that is that is one aspect. Um, you know, uh, I already mentioned, uh, you know, getting support from Maori. Um, Maori, uh, you know, they, they're economically disadvantaged uh, pretty substantially in New Zealand in a lot of cases. And, uh, you know, and going back to my previous employment experience, uh, working with, with local, uh, local hapu there, uh, local tribes, um, you know, the, the reciprocity in terms of, in, in re with regard to support was potentially uh, providing jobs and education to Maori about uh, some of these aspects of, of biotech. And that's, that's an ongoing process and, and it's, it's evolved, I think, for Scion into a bit of a partnership. So it can take many different forms, I suppose, uh, would, be the, would be the short answer. Um, but yeah, this is, like I say, this is an evolving story and, you know, New Zealand is not as, a, you know, we haven't released anything other than medicines. So there is still some, some way to go with that. All right. Thank you. So we've heard in reasonable detail about the food safety uh, review process in Australia and the environmental safety review process in New Zealand. Yes, of course, there's issues but I think to sort of wrap up this Q&A session, I would point out that these are reasonably well thought out regulatory systems. And I think that there are a lot of experiences and such that are useful to all of the regulators in the region and globally. So uh, let's take our lessons from Australia and New Zealand. And um, I'm ready to turn over the floor to the moderator for the next session. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa and Tim. Thanks very much, Eric. Yes, and thanks, Lisa and Tim. And uh, and I'll pick up a little, just a quick theme from um, Tim uh, around the, the traditional owners of the land from which he speaks to us. And uh, I'll just point out that uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation here in Australia, um, in the particular region that I live in. And I pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging. Uh, it's a traditional thing that we would do in respect to the fact that we are migrants, immigrants to the, the lands on which we live and work. And, and that's the segue to our next speaker, um, Dr. Alison Van Enenum, who is herself uh, a migrant from Australia and immigrant to the lands on which she now lives in um, California. She undertook her biotechnology, uh, sorry, her, her bachelor's degree in uh, department, uh, sorry, in agricultural sciences at the University of Melbourne. Uh, she now lives in uh, California and UC in, in Davis and she works at the University of California, Davis, in the Department of Animal Sciences. And she is a, a cooperative extension specialist, uh, particularly in the field of animal genomics and biotechnology. She's uh, got a wide range of publicly funded research and outreach programs that she's been involved in over the years. Um, particularly in uh, animal genomics and biotechnology and livestock production systems. And recently, um, a lot of her work has focused on, on cattle. She's given more than 700 uh, invited presentations to audiences globally. So I'm looking forward to uh, a very um, smooth but impassioned presentation from 
Alison. She's also appeared in many forms of media, uh, including the TV, the Dr. Oz show, um, uh, Science Friday, the Intelligence Squared debate series, where I believe she won with her partner, uh, a debate about the use of biotechnology. And she's also appeared in one of my favorite documentaries, uh, Food Evolution. If you haven't seen it, it's brilliant. It's narrated by uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. So a very lovely presentation and narration, but great content, uh, particularly around this subject. Um, and so without further ado, I'll hand over to Alison. All right, uh, well, Thank you uh, very much, Mark, for that introduction. And I would um, like to really uh, acknowledge Ola and, and the organizing committee for uh, inviting me uh, here uh, for, to speak on this topic. Um, just wanna double check I'm sharing my slide deck because uh, I don't see it coming through. Is that showing up for you guys? Not at the moment. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah, here we go. Now we're in presentation. Yeah. We're in, yep, yeah. that's it. And then swoop. All right. And away. Good Beautiful. Good for you. All right. Yep. So okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's been really interesting, and and I I'm a little trepidatious to finish out the conference because I think that this is such an important topic. Um, and really my training is molecular biology, um, not science communication. And so talk about um, a, not, not an expert in this area, um, but I did wanna share a little bit of my experiences working in this field for, well, almost what, 25 years now, um, because I have watched um, how the public discourse around GMOs in plants has really, precluded the use of this technology in animal breeding. Um, and it's become evident to me that, that we have to change how we have these discussions or we're gonna to continue to not be able to use this technology in livestock improvement programs, which is where my real passion lies. Um, and so I'm gonna, in the story, in the um, spirit of, of science communication, talk a little bit about a story, a personal narrative here. Um, and this cow on the, in the image here is part of my, my narrative. Um, and for those of you don't, that don't know, this is Princess. Um, and she is the offspring of a genome edited bull that was edited to be hornless. Um, and she's standing alongside her comparator, conventional comparator animal, a horned a Hereford, um, that I just found out I didn't need to raise. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> but uh, you can see a very obvious phenotypic difference between these two animals in that one has horns and one doesn't. Um, and I kind of became involved in this project um, as a result actually of a USDA grant to Recombinetics. Um, and they obtained funding to actually do the genome editing work and produce these two bulls that um, were basically um, genetically not growing horns and would pass that trait onto their offspring. And the reason that I was asked to participate in this project was not to do with the editing, but because my program is about um, extension, which is basically um, kind of part of the land grant uh, mission of, in the United States, where there are scientists that work with universities to take science to historically farmers, so take it to the public. It's kind of Norman Borlaug's classic line, take it to the farmer. That's kind of what extension does. And so I was interested in what would industry do when faced with the possibility of, for example, having elite Holstein or dairy genetics that also came along with the characteristic of not growing horns because typically elite dairy animals do grow horns it's um, something that came along with the elite genetics um, and so typically those horns are physically removed and I want to kind of draw your attention to the timelines here because it, it is kind of important so these animals were born in 2015 and this is them at Davis in 20 um, November of 2015 and this publication came out in 2016 um, but in 2016 I actually went to an organization called the National Association of Animal Breeders in the United States who basically um, have a meeting every year and I took my clickers along and asked them a series of questions about this kind of emerging technology of genome editing so just to get a feel for who all was there I asked who are you <laughs> and basically the the artificial insemination industry, not the artificial intelligence industry, the AI or artificial in insemination industry 
and the allied industries that go along with that. So veterinarians, perhaps um, very, very small amount of producers. And this room was maybe, I don't know, two or 300 people or so. So this was really people that work um, at, for AI companies or that are the inseminators that are out in the field that are doing insemination of, of um, cattle in the United States. And so just as a kind of a start off, what traits does the industry value the most out of the six choices that I gave them here? Um, and this was their response. And not surprisingly, um, you know, a, a, an important characteristic for them is, is production or of milk, milk in the case of dairy or beef in the case of um, beef cattle, but not the most important. So you see that disease resistance was actually rated above that at 31%. Um, and interestingly, the most important trait uh, was reproduction or fertility. Um, and in this industry or industry audience of, of AI companies, animal welfare didn't actually rate very highly. Um, and um, in this case, these, these other traits rated more highly. So disease resistance, um, fertility and, and production traits. And then I asked them, if you, would your company consider selling semen from a Holstein bull that had been gene edited for polled, um, just kind of coming out cold turkey? So this is back in 2016. So the, the paper had only just come out. So it was kind of a new concept. And absolutely, yes, said 75% of the companies um, or the participants. Absolutely no, said 20% or 4%. And maybe said 21%. So majority said yes. And at that time, no regulation decision had been made around genome editing in um, the United States. This was before the FDA came out with their guidance 187, and it wasn't clear what the regulatory status of these animals would be. Um, and so how much more on average would you be willing to pay for a genome edited polled sire? Um, and I think this number caught a few people, um, and I don't know if you know that AI sires are actually very expensive. That people can pay a million dollars for them. So $20,000 might look like a lot, but um, actually that's probably not that much. And if you had an elite sire that um, had the best genetics and had polled, um, you'd probably be willing to fork out a bit of money for that. Um, some people not so much, um, but I'm guessing that people that kind of know the value of the sires were more up on the right-hand side there. And then how much more on average do you think you would sell a straw of semen from that um, Book sire um, if you had that added bonus in there. Um, and here the kind of the average was about five to ten dollars. And if you actually look at the cost of dehorning to producers, the labor and the loss in animal um, gain and the likes, it's estimated to be somewhere in the 20 to 30 dollar range. Um, depends on how it's done and it's it's actually quite higher in northern Australia where often they're um, dehorning beef animals um, at, at past a year of age and there can be quite a lot of death loss and the like so um, that would be kind of their how they might um, benefit from this and then the question if it's regulated like conventional breeding which basically has virtually no additional oversight would you consider purchasing a genome edited sire um, and overwhelmingly here um, the opinion was yes for both dairy and beef ai sires um, and there was a small number that said yes for dairy but not beef and then neither dairy or beef so some holdouts right out of the gate even if it's not regulated differently and then if you throw that additional regulatory um, on there, like if you were, if they're regulated like Advantage Salmon, would you consider purchasing a gene edited sire? You see quite a big shift from um, the previous slide where people that, I think it was 92% earlier, the majority of them moved over to neither um, beef or dairy if they're going to be regulated like a GMO. And so regulation is actually really important for industry um, as to how they'll do it. And I asked them, what's the greatest factor influencing your decision to purchase a genome edited sire or not? And interesting to me, um, economics was, was a big driver, not surprisingly, so 50%. Um, but more important than regulation was consumer perception. Um, and that was at 36% and then a small contribution to intellectual property. So obviously consumer perception is important. Um, and that's part of my talk here today. Although the value of the trait to industry has got to be part of the discussion as well. Um, so this particular edit that I'm going to be talking about is a project, as I mentioned, that was um, in collaboration with Recombinetics, who produced these two bulls that had um, basically an alteration where in the case of uh, dairy animals, this polled gene um, has an upstream regulatory sequence where 10 base pairs has been replaced 
by 212 base pairs in animals that are naturally genetically dehorned, like Angus. And so there's basically, if you do the math, a 212 base pair addition upstream of the polled gene that results in this dominant polled trait. Um, so that's why it's big P. And so this animal must be recessive, little p, little p. Um, and that is what you normally find in um, dairy animals. And in the case of these animals, this was replaced by this 212 base pair region in the homozygous condition. Um, and so we had the animals at Davis and we bred them to horned Hereford. So again, horned is recessive. So little p, little p and big P, big P. And you don't need to know too much about Mendel to figure out that probably these heterozygous big P, little P calves did not grow horns. Um, and that's the case. And we actually produced um, six of these animals um, and we followed their um, health over two years, we sequenced them. And most recently, we have taken uh, milk and meat from all of them and done compositional analysis, um, basically to set, a, I guess, some data in the public literature to help with these regulatory decisions around what is, you know, what, what do we need for these types of approvals. Um, and so here you can see um, two of our offspring that didn't grow horns and they are flanking either side here of my contemporary comparator control <laughs> animal, which was basically a horned Her uh, Holstein that was mated to horned Hereford. And so we had a bunch of these very random um, half dairy, half beef animals at our feedlot, which didn't thrill my beef manager. And we, this is a male, so these two, two bulls here. And then this is a female and this is princess here um, alongside poor old Cinderella because no one was interested in her because she just has conventionally bred and she just um, grows horns. So that's basically, this really nice visual phenotype that you can you can use to describe the technology and, and have a discussion with the public around it. And so we've already published data um, on the genotypic and phenotypic analysis, and we're just now writing up the compositional analysis. Um, but what I think I want to talk about is the fact that we've been able to use these animals to do a lot of public outreach, and there's been a lot of media interest in these animals. And so Science Friday, which is kind of like the ABC of America, so it's um, NP National Public Radio um, video show, came out and, and did a um, feature on these animals back in, I think this was uh, 2016. Um, Cornell Alliance for Science um, partnered with us um, after seeing these animals discussed at the Transgenic Animal Conference and put out a nice, really nice little three minute video that just doesn't go into the technical details, but it kind of explains the rationale for why um, we were doing this. You know, why do you dehorn? Why is genetics a different approach to this? Um, that's been really useful for public outreach. And of course, it doesn't hurt that the calves were very cute. As, as all calves are when they're born. Um, and then uh, Wired magazine actually ended up doing a feature of Princess on the front cover of her magazine. And this was in 2019. Um, and this is actually one of the pictures they took. And it was actually pretty funny because they approached me to do this photo and they're like, we'd, we'd like to get your cow into a green screen room. <laughs> Like it's a cow. Uh, I don't think that's happening. Um, but they said, "Well, let's. We're going to do a photo shoot." Um, and so poor old princess was looking a little rough. So we brought her into the shoot and got her all cleaned up for her shot. Um, and here she is getting her 15 minutes of fame. Um, the photographer taking her, and we put up a black uh, thing behind her because we couldn't really get a green screen to work. And you can see we had the photographer and their assistant, and I think there was a director and a director's assistant as well. So there were four people out at the feedlot taking a picture of a cow, uh, much to the amusement of, of the guys there. Um, and there she is on the cover of Wired. Um, and there was a really nice story in there. Um, but, you know, I kind of looked at that image. I'm like, wow, it's a little sinister, really, um, because this is what she actually looked like. And it seems like often the media tend to kind of dramatize this. And I, I felt a bit bad for Princess because she's not a sinister looking girl. She's a nice looking girl. But then I saw the picture they had of me in there and I was like, whoa, that's the archangel of death. So I guess that's just kind of what uh, media does. But we have been able to bring these animals to our public outreach event, which is called Picnic Day at UC Davis. Um, and here you can see we had a display and his princess alongside, um, she was with her mother at this stage, but there was a horned animal next to her. And we had some horns that the kids play with um, and they basically ran around and 
had an opportunity to discuss this. And during this, we had a public outreach event where we brought people in and surveyed them on their attitudes towards genome editing. So here is uh, Princess and, and um, Cinderella. And here we are um, having our sit down survey. People had clickers so they could answer questions. Um, and I did this in collaboration with my graduate students, one of whom spoke about the breeding aspects and another of whom is a, a um, works with an animal welfare specialist to talk about the pain aspects of breeding, uh, of sorry, dehorning. And then at the beginning, we quizzed them. And then at the end, we quizzed them to get their attitude to the use of genome editing for animal welfare traits. Um, so at the beginning, um, and I'll show you a couple of slides like this, the yellow is what we got before we gave the presentation and the blue is after the presentation. And this was one of the run-in questions. What percentage of animal products like milk, meat, and eggs currently come from animals that have been produced using genome engineering? And this was back in 2018. And if anyone's been paying attention tonight, you'll know that the correct answer to this question is zero, um, because basically the salmon hadn't yet come to market in the US and the pig hadn't been approved. And so amongst this audience of people that are admittedly attending a university open house, so probably a little nerdy, um, only 5% of this audience um, got that correct at the beginning of the talk. And I guess as an educator, perhaps as concerningly after the talk where we very clearly said there was nothing on the market, we still only had 26 of the respondents get that correct, which was kind of a little bit distressing. So I'm not really sure how these other people didn't quite get the zero. But anyway, I guess I'm not a very good communicator is my take home from that. Um, but what is interesting was how do you feel about the use of genome editing to address an animal welfare concern? Um, and here, strongly support, moderately support, um, all the way through to strongly oppose, no idea, um, and decline to answer. The take home here was 88% of respondents at this event were strongly or moderately supportive of using gene editing to address an animal welfare concern, i.e. polled in this particular case. And basically, after the presentation, it tended to move people that were somewhat supportive to strongly supportive. Um, people that were opposed didn't really move. In fact, a couple got more opposed as, as we went through the talk. Um, and that was uh, kind, of, kind of our experience. And there's actually been a couple of papers that say that um, public attitudes towards genetically modified poll cattle um, are is seen positively by the public. Um, and this paper uh, that came out in 2019 suggests that maybe um, people are more likely to support GM technologies when they're perceived to benefit the animal. Um, and interestingly, if you remember back to the NAAB survey, the animal welfare didn't rate very highly, but I think there is one in there that does rate highly in probably both audiences and that's disease resistance. And it seems to me, the messaging around the, the um, types of things we're working on has to include things that resonate with kind of the values of, of the general public. And I do think disease resistance, whether it's African swine fever or, or PERS or um, uh, especially respiratory and disease resistance at the moment might get a lot of, uh, lot of traction. Um, and I just, I wanted to um, show you guys a little um, fun, piece of SciComm I did recently because we were fortunate to um, have 2021 be the availability for the first time ever of a genetically engineered food animal in the United States. And so just prior to the Transgenic Animal Conference in August, we had an all GMO meal. And I want to show you this video, which doesn't talk about the technology or what you know, promoter we used or anything. It just shows good food, good times, and good products. And so I'm going to, without further ado, uh, play you a little one minute video.
Um, so I encourage you to share that, that little one minute on YouTube if you want to uh, share it with friends. But I'll just finish with this. The most um, desired market, uh, aquacultural, uh, not aquaculture, excuse me, aquarium fish in the US, I think 15% of all aquarium sales is now the glowfish. Not a food application, but a product that people want. And I must admit in, in full disclosure, I have six of them in my tank here at home. Um, and so they have done remarkably well. It's a very successful product that people want. And so I think the narrative that the public will not accept the products produced by genetically modified animals hasn't really ever been put to the test because we haven't had anything yet. Um, as Because until now, such food products have not been available. And if the products are something people want um, and are allowed to come to market, the technology can be successful. And I use the example of Glowfish, but also an interesting example here in, in the US is the Impossible Burger. It's a plant-based, uh, soy-based burger that has genetically engineered heme um, to give it the, the bleed, if you will, the red uh, bleed of a hamburger. And that has been a very successful product. There hasn't been pushback on that at all. And so I think if products, people want are available that this whole kind of narrative that the public won't accept it is not borne out by actual market data. And as we've learned over the past year, very painfully, science doesn't change minds and it doesn't necessarily result in evidence-based policy decisions. And I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to get political. But I think many potential applications of biotechnology do address traits that are of concern to the general public, like disease resistance, animal welfare and resilience, and product quality traits. And I think Aquabounty is doing a beautiful job right now of emphasizing shared values um, of being able to grow that fish in the United States with a reduced environmental footprint in a sustainable way. They don't emphasize the method that was used to produce it. They emphasize the benefits and where it aligns with people's values. And I think that um, that's really how the public communication has to go. Um, and it doesn't really matter how these animals were produced, but this messaging and, and storytelling, if you will, is such an important consideration in the commercialization of these products. And I think that's the message that, that we have to take home and whose job is it to do it? I'm not sure, but I know if we don't do it, that we will not be allowed to use these technologies. And so I encourage everyone that's um, involved in this to, to, to do your bit in terms of um, trying to get the message out and to actually discuss the use of this technology and, and the benefits that it, it potentially can provide. So with that, I uh, will stop sharing my screen and open up or pass it back to Mark. Oh, well, in fact, open it up to questions, uh, exactly as you're going to say. Alison, that was great and spot on to time. Um, I loved the sharing of that uh, short version of the of the video. <laughs> GM, for, you know, like, the foods are out there now it's it's starting to happen um so yeah look uh, that there, there have been a, a number of questions and i invite people to uh, continue to to put post them up um one of the first questions was um in relation to that change in perception of the uh, of the breeders um there was a great study a great taking a great opportunity with interacting to to get some sense from a key um component in that through chain from where here's the animals the science through to getting to the public uh, the, the change in their attitude when they saw there was regulation do you think that was driven by the their perception of the cost of the regulation or their perception of the impact that would have on the perception of the product by the public <laughs> it's kind of like trying to unravel that's the yeah i i think that's a really hard question to answer and, and it, probably a little bit of both you know I think um, in my experience the particularly the dairy industry got hit hard by recombinant BST uh, uh, RBST um, and they are gun shy of doing anything that can allow 
the marketers to suggest that their product is, is, is not good in some way, or, you know, basically the monetarization of the fear around GMOs has created its own little you know, market. Um, and they don't want to, they don't want to have something that the, the, the competitors can use against them. And so I think there's a real hesitancy there, unfortunately, that um, is, is a, is a painful reminder of that. And then also I do think, I mean, at that time, the fish, um, had not been approved or maybe had just been approved, but it was still another, what, six years before we had that meal. Um, and so I think there is, yeah, there is a, a hesitancy for what the cost of that might look like. And, and quite frankly, if it takes more than two weeks to approve um, the next generation of genome edited bulls, then the next generation will already be better because they're getting better every year. Um, and yeah. so you can't <laughs> hold up an animal for 15 years seeing if the meat and milk from a polled animal is equivalent to a non-polled animal um, because your genetics of your competitors will already have surpassed you basically. So yeah, that's a really important notion in animal breeding is we're getting better every, every generation. And so you can't hold up progress. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, Alison. I was going to lead to another question, but it's worth following that through because, you know, I think that that is a significant impact in terms of how we can, um, make benefit from animal biotechnology and, and you've kind of pointed it out there that it's this issue that fits in with polls you can poll by just breeding with a cow that's polled but you lose half your values and no one's prepared to do that which is why we need this technology it does it in a single generation but those generations are constantly being improved and so we have to figure out how we how we time the the approvals and it does vary from industry to industry and i think the cattle industry is one in particular where this needs to be resolved some other industries that there's some steps in generation from they're improved to when they get to market but it, it's still well, just, going to be difficult just look at our, that little example i gave of, of the, the polled animals right so they were born i think they were actually edited in 2014 14, yeah. born in 2015 it's now 2021 we've just now finished the meat analysis of the f1 <laughs> um yeah. and we are doing you know and so and that's with a usda grant for biotech risk assessment which was you know provided the funding to do that um, that's six years, six, seven years. That's, that's not, that's not going to work. Um, that, that's yeah. the end of it. Uh, even, even if it passes and gets in and everything. So I think, um, you know, I think it's, it's great to do that one time, um, just to kind of provide some data and to have a discussion, but that can't be the standard, um, or else it basically will cost it out of the market. Yeah. And that does point towards perhaps the need for, some different systems of, of how these things are assessed, so that the safety of the process, uh, and then just some simple tick marks that you have to do on the outcome to enable that to happen in, in real time for animal right. breeding um, processes. Um, another question that came through was to do with the thermal tolerance um, as a you know as a trait that can be modified and and how that might be received. I mean, like that. I mean, potentially it's a welfare of the animal to make it um, perform better in, a, in, a, in a, a different environment. But then again, the flip side of that is, well, is that just a production trait because it's, you know, you're making the animal uh, production animal in an environment that it's not really suited for. You're trying to tailor it to that. Yeah, is that a good, you, good trait? You, you say production trait, like that's a bad thing. And I think that we yeah. need to rephrase how we discuss that because you know, aqua bounty is a production trait, yeah. but yeah. it's a production trait that enables them to be grown locally and to do so with less feed. And, you know, so th yes, production traits have a negative connotation, but actually they're part of uh, reducing oh, the yeah. environmental footprint. Um, but with regards to thermotolerance, so you're obviously well aware of the slick mutation um, that originated, I think, in center pole cattle. Um, yeah. That is, is one gene, I think, in my opinion, um, a lot of traits that have to do with um, thermotolerance that are maybe in well-adapted tropical breeds that aren't in for, you know, the animals in our back or in my background um, is going to be multifaceted. And so there are some simple single gene traits that could be introduced, but I, you know, to live in the tropics, you need tick resistance and you need a whole bunch of other stuff that maybe some of these, um, you know, Bostaurus animals don't quite have. And so I think it's 
going to be a little bit more tricky than that. But having said that, there's no reason why not to do slick, right? And so I think I, I, I don't, I, I get nervous that it gets posed as a silver bullet. But at the same yeah. time, I, I often use the analogy of um, an ice cream sundae with a cherry on top and the editing is the cherry on top. And you can have a cherry, an ice cream sundae without the cherry on top, you know, with traditional breeding. But it's yeah. nice if it does have a cherry on top. So, you know, it, why ban the cherry? Uh, <laughs> so that's <laughs> my, my question. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that, that, that sort of speaks to this thing about what are the examples um, that we can take forward that will have that buy-in from the public because again sort of coming back to to some of the, the work that you did there again with the, the the open day and seeing what the public's response is you know do do you feel that the field needs those kinds of things the the best examples that we can as the as the thin end of the wedge to push in and open up the conversation with the public certainly the the visual is is helpful um yeah. because otherwise it's like here's my you know animal that looks exactly like this other animal and it's it's yeah. hard to appreciate maybe it's thermotolerant or it's disease disease resistance although i guess you know yeah. you could have a sick pig but um i think that that was part of the the attraction i will say we did have a couple as you probably saw of protesters that came to that meeting um and so you do have to have your plan as to how you're going to deal with that um and what i always remember is there's, there's a bell curve of people there's people that are very pro and very people that are very anti and they're very noisy and most people are in the middle of that bell curve and they're watching and, and seeing how the interaction goes and you know are you being civil um and, and are they being civil and are you you know are you having a discussion or a yelling match and and i think there's an opportunity there to demonstrate goodwill and um make sure that you you keep it at a level that the, the, the silent majority are watching what you're doing um, and you have to think through how to handle the, you know, sometimes difficult conversations that are associated with this technology. So uh, a, a question that's arisen and this kind of relates to that is, is um, when we talk about the public, but then for many countries in Asia, the conversations are early and it's actually uh, the moment for scientists reaching out to, um, to policymakers and, and regulators. And, and I guess that the, I'm thinking that's where this question uh, aims at. It, it's basically how can we improve effective science communication and raising awareness on animal biotechnology to, you know, maybe not just to the public audience, but to the audience, to some extent, to us that counts, which is the, the people that will form that bit in between us and the public. I, I mean, I think you, you do have to go to your equivalent of Washington DC, whatever that might be, and be involved in these committee meetings and the, the types of things that um, was mentioned earlier that, um, for example, Lisa said she was involved in this, you know, discussion and that discussion and, and actually try and have a seat at the table um, and um, not be um, afraid to, to say when things are being, especially regulations are being proposed that are, you know, don't make any scientific sense because you can kill a technology with overregulation and I, and I would argue genetic engineering in animals has been um, and I I'm very nervous to lose genome editing to the same problem um, and so I think it's up to us to to say look this is a really valuable technology and, and be part of the discussion um, and you have to have a little bit of um, security of employment I'm very fortunate at a university you know, yeah. I could say what I want and no one can fire me. Um, you know, it's easy for me to say that, you know, regulators should speak up or whoever, but it's like, well, if that's their job, you know, that, that's maybe a little bit of a different scenario. So I do think having an independent academic that um, doesn't have, you know, their job doesn't depend on it is, and that does have work in this area and expertise is really a helpful thing. And so I, I would really encourage um, academic researchers to, to do it. But of course, you know, it's regulatory discussions are quite, frustrating at times and so it's not everybody's cup of tea so but I think it's important because otherwise why do if you, why do the research if you can never use the products um you know it's, yeah. it, I guess to me it's it's almost you know pr pragmatic it's like I don't want to not use this technology too yeah and that's a that, another great point I mean like you know for those of us that come from that research end of things uh it, it is frustrating now to see the the applications and the benefits that could flow from this 
and that, that we can all you know have a sense is going to be much needed uh, i mean like you know uh, this being an asia oceania meeting that the population growth for the planet is driven through the asia region and and the the, the pressure on generating high quality foods from animals is is going to largely going to be here there's some other big places around the world africa and south america where that's happened too but um you know here's a, a space where the pressure on the system we can see where some of the things that are available to us in biotechnology can add value improve things you know improve sustainability which is going to be most important break down disease which is you know important in both directions animal welfare which people are concerned more about plus uh, the impacts on production so yeah, it's, it's it can be frustrating, but then there's also the, the flip side, which is regulators have put in place um, based around this issue of maintaining safety. And, and I guess it's that thing about as scientists, we look at the science that's um, in this in terms of what, what is um, not safe versus the value systems that are driving the public perception, which impacts on the politicians who make the policies that the regulators then have to put in place. So it's a it's a an interesting spectrum that we sit in uh let's see are there any more questions that we have up here at the moment no there are no more questions um so there is uh, there is one i think that just came in on the questions and answer and i, right. I don't know I, we may want to invite back um some of the other speakers regarding off targets. I, I think uh, Lisa, Lisa made a fairly uh, yeah. strong statement in that regard. Um, and I, I do believe it's become the boogeyman of, of yeah. editing. So it's kind of the unknown, unknown, unknowns. Um, and it's, I guess I, 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 you have to put again in context of naturally occurring genetic variation, like that, 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 that is the basis of all evolution, right? So every meal you've ever eaten has off targets uh, relative to every other meal. And so it's become as if off targets are on in and of themselves a safety hazard. Um, and, and I think that um, it's, it's very different when you're editing a human patient somatically for cancer treatment or something where you might switch switch on a, a oncogene or something yeah. as distinct from editing animals where if if you do something that really messes them up they'll never be born um, and yeah. so if they're running around healthy animals you've already done an incredibly um, complex experiment to see are you a functional living being that's healthy <laughs> um, and that's a that's a pretty big experiment and, and lots of lots of animals don't pass that experiment right and so I think that there's has to be uh, kind of an understanding that variation in your food DNA variation in and of itself is not a hazard um, and that that's distinct from potential somatic editing for for therapeutic purposes in human medicine and that's where the off-target discussion starts and then it kind of gets carried over to agriculture like it's relevant and and I I, I have a hard time coming up with the hazard yeah, I think that's again that one of the uh, the good answer to that question too, because I think um, there, there are regulatory issues that sit in the background of that, but I think they're being looked at uh, reasonably sensibly. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's a a misapprehension by everyone about what animal breeding is about. Mm -hmm. and where the animals that we eat today have come from compared to the wild creatures that were domesticated ten thousand years ago. Sex. I love giving lectures to students. I put up sex in big red letters and let the X dissolve into a chromosome shape. That's what it's all about, vari natural variation. And the problem that we have about identifying off targets is very often distinguishing it from background variation because there will be variation from generation to generation. It's like, did it come from the, the technology or was it natural? Does it matter? Because of the filter, as, as you said, the filter to get to a, a living animal that is born that stands up and walks around or swims around if it's the fish is is the is the major filter so yeah um there was another question actually here we go in in the role of august bodies like the national academy of sciences or our um australian um academy of uh, uh, learned um, organizations so uh, what do you think their role is in this sort of debate um well, I mean, the, the role of the National Academies and uh, maybe similar in Australia is is really to um, provide unbiased scientific opinion to 
to Congress, is, is my understanding anyway, but Americans can probably correct me. <laughs> they're over on the East Coast, so they're probably asleep because it's 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, but, um, you know, I think that they're always going to give a scientific answer because they're going to have a bunch of science nerds on those things giving scientific answers. And to your point that that doesn't necessarily translate into policy um, and that politicians are obeying a different master um, and so policy may not represent that. I think you have to start with, with these are these are the facts um, as we've seen if if that if that's not your foundation you get some very strange decisions and, and recommendations that get made um, at least uh, there has been as it relates to uh, COVID over here so I, I mean I think if nothing else um, it's this this pandemic has kind of um, crystallized how misinformation can can harm public health. And I, I guess I feel like you know, agricultural scientists kind of like hold my beer <laughs> um, because I feel like we've been dealing with this for a long time. And it's just now people are going, wow, you know, this, this, this actual marketing of fear and, and kind of alternative products that um, have dubious efficacy is actually a real a real problem and it's really hard to counter with science and facts um, and expertise and um, I think that the medical profession is is facing that at the moment and, and I don't think we have a good handle on it to be honest I, um, because we have you know real hesitancy around taking yeah. a, a safe effective vaccine. Yeah absolutely it, it, it's, a, it's a warning to us I guess in, mm -hmm. in this field um, not to rely just purely on the nature of the science and I've got scribbled down on a piece of paper in front of me here science versus values um, you know we, we always mm. want to talk about this but we've got to accept that there are values and we have to face how we deal with that um, and, and how they impact on acceptance of, of the things that we're proposing and, and that we would like to see come through. Alison I, I just I will, we'll have to draw it to a close because we're getting towards the uh, the end of the of the um, workshop uh, I'd say a huge thank you because it is actually for those who don't know nearing midnight in um, California um, so you've stayed alert and awake for us which is absolutely fantastic um, Ola I believe that it's down to me now to um, do a little bit of a, a drawing up and a, and a wrap up a key takeaway message um, from today and yesterday um, in which case I'll launch straight into it. I, I think, you know, my, my take on this, we've, we've had an, um, a huge thanks on our behalf to uh, the range of speakers that we've had. They've covered a broad range of, of issues and topics that relate to um, the application of gene technology, animal biotechnology in, in agriculture. Um, and we've seen that there have been some uh, huge steps forward, you know, through the, the new opportunities that technologies like CRISPR um, present to us and um, that, that we've heard a range of possibilities of things coming through. Uh, and reminder, there's only one product on the market at the moment that uses biotechnology in, in the production of an animal food for consumption by humans. Um, but there's a lot, obviously, in the sidelines ready to come forward. We've heard that a great presentation there about the importance of communication, because I think communicating why we want to use this, what the value is for the public who are the ultimate arbiters um, and to everyone in the chain on the way through. The regulators are absolutely critical, obviously for us, because we have to pass through that filter with the things that we bring on as scientists and, and aim towards the public. Um, but they're there to maintain safety and we have to embrace that and, and work with them. I think, you know, it's also been clear that the, the regulatory systems are not standing still. It's really reassuring to see that they're, the regulators are working almost as hard as we are to take a look at what all of these technologies mean in terms of changing the kinds of um, policy and regulation that was set in place two decades ago to deal with um, biotechnology coming through in plant um, food production. So uh, flexibility seems to be a common theme. There's, there's uh, attempts in a lot of these systems to, to build in some flexibility. Um, of course, you know, um, as scientists, we see this drive to safety in a different way because we look at the, the scientific detail of safety, um, but there are laws that are in place um, that, that set the scene for the regulations and there, there are boundaries around that. So we, we have to work with that. Uh, there are reviews uh, of things changing. Across Asia, I think the great opportunity is many countries who are looking at this and saying, gosh, we need to put some regulations in place 
and that that is being informed through this debate. And so for the participants that we have online, um, uh, I, you know, I, I invite you reach out to us. Um, I think you can see that the, there's a, a very positive and um, friendly and welcoming community here amongst uh, both the scientists and the regulators in this space. There's a community that's been pulled together. ISA is um, a fantastic organization for doing that, for bringing these things um, together. And my hat's off to Ola and her team. I think a huge round of applause for them. They have done a terrific job in pulling together the um, the, the, the program for this and also handling all of the technical background issues to make it possible for us to see this presentation, to have people from so many places around the world all in the one room here um, together. So um, a huge thanks to Ola and yes, just a, a call out to everyone. Communication is absolutely essential, not just with the public, the regulators, but between us as a community to try and take this forward. Uh, and we're looking for, you know, harmonization and ways to bring this technology, not just in individual countries, but between countries, sharing this and sharing the benefits for us all, for the agricultural production systems, and ultimately for people, for making good, safe foods more effectively, more sustainably, uh, just better. And uh, with that, I'll hand over back to uh, Ola to finally wrap up. And thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, indeed a very exciting workshop, uh, the first in Asia Oceania. And uh, we have gathered a lot of panelists, uh, experts from different parts of the world. The exchanges are, are excellent. And we have seen how uh, each country have uh, developed their own R&Ds in different animal species, and we hope that other countries can also join us in the future. Or we're expecting countries like uh, Vietnam, um, uh, Malaysia, and uh, and others, and you want to hear from them. Actually, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, we are looking at some activities, some important activities in the future, because this is this virtual workshop actually has gained us a lot of momentum in capacity building and in science communication, uh, in regulation, and of course, the science. So I would like to invite uh, all the, all the uh, attendees to please respond to the post webinar survey. We have questions there that we need your information or your inputs. Uh, so that we can move forward, we can uh, extend the learnings that we have learned in these two days. So for example, we want to have your information on um, what other capacity building activities that you would like so that you can appreciate and you can benefit from animal biotechnology and what are the um, who are the experts that needs further engagement or focus discussion with our experts that we have now? And also what are your the gaps that your country needs? So uh, I hope that when we receive your post webinar survey, we would be able to discern uh, some of these uh, activities that will target to your needs and we can help you out with that. So in closing, I would like to thank again, all the panelists. Thank you so much to our expert moderators, Mark Dizard and Eric Hallerman, and also to our, uh, all our uh, uh, supporters, of course, USDA, CSIRO, Virginia Tech, and ISA and ISA Biotechnology Information Centers. And well, this is really a wishful thinking that we will see each other face to face. We have been <coughs> meeting every other week, the Animal Biotechnology Organizing Workshop uh, Committee, and we're uh, looking forward for a face to face, hopefully very soon. So with that, thank you so much once again, <coughs> and uh, see you next time for another engaging animal biotechnology workshop in the region or internationally. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.